Hello and welcome to episode 109 of the Arena Regulars podcast. I'm Zach. And I'm Jeff. And we're a source for drunken Magic the Gathering Arena content. That's right. Just a couple of regular dudes drinking some irregular beers and talking about Magic the Gathering and usually the online client MTG Arena, but a little different today. That's right. Jeff, oh, it's one of my favorite episodes. Here we go. It is our drunken Vorthos for the March of the Machine story, part one. That's right. This time around, the uh, the story is twice as long. So we will be doing two parts to our drunken Vorthos for it. So very exciting stuff. We got a great story for you tonight. But Jeff, it wouldn't be a drunken Vorthos if it wasn't a silver series. That's right. Here on the Arena Regulars, we rate our beers on a scale of bronze to mythic. In that ranking system, silver is where the macro brews get placed. But we want to show you that we love silver beers as well. And so we're going to have a competition to find the very best silver beer out there. Um, we've what are we on the second stage? What's it's it been, like second bracket. It's been going on for quite a long time. Uh, yeah. So we're we're deep, deep into it. But um, yeah, so I did kind of pitch it like we were just starting. But yeah, uh, no, that's <laughs> we've been doing it for a while. Um, this is like the round of sixteen, or I guess, or is that, is that even true? Is it like the round of thirty-two? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't even know at this point. But uh, we are um, we've tried these beers before, and they've made it to the second bracket or second round of of That's tastings. Right. So, um, so we'll drink four of them today. Yes. All of these are previous top twos. We'll mm -hmm. rank them from silver four to silver one. Silver one being the best, of course. Silver one and silver two will move on to the next round. Okay, Jeff. Can you tell us what our first beer is for today? Yes, the beer needs no introduction. This is Heineken. Um, 1873. Yeah, old. Drinking some old beers. Yeah. We like to do these in order just because it's fun. Um, anyone says that biases our results can go to hell. So. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's also uh, our previous ratings, both Jeff and I rated this at silver two the last time we were, uh, were drinking this. So um, we'll see if that holds up. But Jeff, let's crack this open because I, I haven't had a beer in a little bit. So I need some <laughs> beer. Alrighty. Uh, also, before we get started, just uh, if you don't know much about what has been happening in the story, March of the Machine is kind of the climax or the the ending of what's been going on for a long time. So go check out our other Drunken Vorthos episodes if you want to catch up. And if you only want like a little refresher, just listen to the All Will Be One story because that's the most important so far. Um, because, uh, well, things happen very soon after that one wrapped up. So uh, that one's... Yeah. I think if you like wanted to go back to the official beginning, you'd have to go back to Kaldheim, which was mm -hmm. our first drunken Vorthos. So that would yeah, listen to them all if you want. Listen yeah. to them all. Uh, awesome, wonderful. So, Jeff, we will be getting into the March of the Machine, which is written by K. Arsenault Riviera. Um, this is a name we have heard before because this mm -hmm. person also wrote the story for Innistrad Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow. Uh, so this means that uh, I already have kind of low expectations for this story because <laughs> Jeff and I didn't really love those ones. <laughs> they weren't our favorite. No. Um, so I just immediately starting off the story, I was like, uh oh, yeah. I, I hope I like this one. No, the, and the, that it has nothing really to do with this this author. I, I mean, it does because obviously they wrote it, but like, I don't think that they're bad at writing. I just don't know if this specifically magic is like their favorite thing to write. Um, mm -hmm. So it, I'm not sure. But anyway, it's just they're not my favorite. I, I don't want to throw too much shade, but uh, that was yeah. my first initial thought uh, coming into this. Yeah, I sort of saw it as like, 
this this is for me their chance to sort of redeem themselves. I there thought one go. of the big problems with Midnight Hunt was the way the combat was written. Mm -hmm. um, it was often really difficult to tell if a werewolf was in human form or wolf form in the middle of a fight, and it would mm -hmm. for some reason it would always matter, and I. I would be thinking they're in the wrong form and then something wouldn't make sense and I'd have to like go back yeah. to redo it. So uh, there's less or, you know, none or certainly less werewolf fights in this one. So. Yes. So um, uh, we'll have to check in with how we feel about this story, how it's going at the end of the podcast. But Jeff, how about we just jump right into it? We Let's have it. episode one, Triumph of the Fleshless. So... We are starting exactly where we left off with All Will Be One, which is Elish Norn with all of her Phyrexian eyes, completed planeswalker standing behind her. And she's looking at the three remaining planeswalkers who survived, um, which is Kaya, Tyvar, and Kaito. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Jeff, do you want to give us a little rundown of what's going on? Yeah, so basically... Elish Norn is kind of monologuing here. Um, and she's talking about how like the three, you know, worms that are still around, the, the the people you mentioned that are still alive. And she's essentially saying, like, she's kind of doing up the bit, oh, you you can join us, you could be one of us. Look at how I've completed your friends, and they're so much better. And so she's just like one by one announcing all of the planeswalkers that they completed. I think mostly to remind us um mm -hmm. but because there's a lot and if you don't remember it's like luca nahiri uh nissa jace and vraska i think is around um as well but um, yeah and then I, I forget when exactly this happens but they like bring in shieldred as well i was a little lost on this part um yeah, so there's a side story. There's yes, there has to be a side story, and this is possibly one of the flaws with magic story in general is that um, we primarily just read the main story because that's what mm -hmm. we want to. That's what it seems most interesting. Um, something must have happened with Shieldred because yeah. this part comes out of nowhere to me. <laughs> There was some sort of betrayal. Shieldred was trying to like overthrow Elishnorn or something. I don't know, and gets caught by the Johnny. Yeah, and a Johnny like brings her in and throws her on the ground in front of Elishnorn. It's like, what should we do with this one? Yeah, um, and while that's kind of happening, Elishnorn is like, oh, um, talking about her three little worms, which are uh, Kaya, Kaito, and Tyvar, and. Uh, she wants them to leave at some point to like warn everyone in the multiverse that they are invading and to get people ready to fight them because Elishorn's like, we're going to complete you all anyway, but let's have a good fight or something. I'm kind of confused why she I exactly... didn't totally get this part, but they needed a story reason of how these people get out. Yeah. And there but... isn't a reasonable way other than Elishorn lets them leave. Yeah. Uh, which she doesn't exactly let them leave so she tells nahiri to bind them up or give them restraints so nahiri like cocoons them in like stone to their neck and so mm -hmm. they're like stuck in stone but then while that's happening elish norn's like i've seen them like phase through walls and like right. transform their body into different things so they will get out of this but it'll slow them down or this will do for now it it seems kind of like she's toying with them a bit it's it doesn't really seem like she is telling us that she doesn't care if they get away because she wants them to get away i think her right. reasoning for wanting them to get away doesn't make a lot of sense i think three more completed planeswalkers yeah. on your team sounds a lot better but right it just doesn't and it doesn't feel like her either because she's very calculated and not mm -hmm. like they do talk about her arrogance as being her weakness but not necessarily like toying with people's emotions and stuff like that like doesn't really care about that yeah um she cares about winning yes i and... thought it was like oh they'll go and spread they'll talk about like what they've seen here and people will know they can't win it's like inevitable because they'll go off and be like oh man they have they have a crazy army yeah i thought that was what she was trying to say but also like 
I don't know, when they see your crazy army descending upon them, then well, I don't they know already... if something need, needs to be heralded. But... Yeah, so, but it did seem like she wanted them to prepare. Mm -hmm. I don't know, it was, whatever. But Ella Schnorn, this is all from her perspective. So a lot of it's her talking about how great being all, like all of one mind is and like being one is is perfection and kind of saying that like individuality is like the uh, scourge of the earth and you should destroy it kind of um like... yeah they make a very strong like phyrexian they, they make a few like phyrexian stances on certain things that i don't know if have appeared uh before as like openly yeah which is hate. well it's not phyrexians it's specifically elish norn well i okay. so okay so they okay. want Elish Norn wants everyone to look the same and be like like minded and all of them have like this weird like telepathic connection where like she they can hear her thoughts and she can right it's the hive mind yeah the thing where the other praetors want perfection but they don't believe that is what perfection is and so right. like like Eurobrask doesn't think that and he hates all mm -hmm. the all be one crap and I think something like that happened with Shielded as well. Yeah, that's what I was going to guess as well. Um, but anyways, like, Norn is telling the worms, oh, all will be one, beautiful, blah, blah, blah. Children's yeah. like, what a load of shit. You don't <laughs> care about Phyrexia. You just care about yourself and power. Yeah. And this is, like, one of your ways to exert your influence is there's only one voice, and it's yours. Mm -hmm. And uh, Elish Norn doesn't take too kindly to that. No. She just orders a Johnny to cut her head off. Just <laughs> yeah. done. And he does. And he does do that. Yeah. <laughs> Shieldred yeah. is dead. <laughs> they killed yeah. Shieldred. Um, so wow. many standard fans uh, rejoicing right now. They yeah. wished it, Shieldred would get the axe a while ago. But... Yeah. Yeah. So she got, uh, she didn't get cut down, but I guess she was they went for her throat i guess that's the good example um <laughs> yeah uh they also explain that um they shouldn't just leave her body there that she could be used for parts um yeah. oh also i think it's important to to note that she isn't the giant spider version of oh herself. yeah, yeah it's not... <laughs> she takes up the whole like balcony <laughs> or whatever so like uh shield is actually kind of like this little insect thing that's sticks her butt on stuff, I guess. I don't really know. <laughs> yeah. But like, so all that other stuff is like her, like her, something that she's kind of, I don't know. It's like a shell. It's like, it's kind of like a hermit crab, like shoves its body yeah. into a shell kind of. I, I, don't, like, like, I always just pictured her as like just a torso with a, and a head, yeah. like just a female upper body kind of thing. Basically. She like wiggles her way into, you know, carapaces. Yeah. I guess because they they you can pluck her out of it and that's what they did so she was like in her just torso with like a little bit of i don't know i don't know what the bottom half of shield yeah looks like. I i'm trying not to think about it too much <laughs> but anyway she doesn't have a head anymore they're going to recycle all of her pieces and then use it for something else um yeah wonderful and then after that happens we ellish Dorn kind of looks to her new favorite uh person it's like the the planeswalker that's going to be her right hand now that shieldred's gone uh and that's nissa she is mm -hmm. really taken by nissa uh specifically because of her control over realm breaker uh so as a reminder realm breaker is the tree that they use the essence from the world tree to create and this is the tree that is uh branching off into all the different uh multiverses and all the different planes and that's how they're invading is the realm breaker which nissa controls and moves around and stuff yeah so big big deal um and then jeff what do we do we just uh just kind of talk for a bit yeah so <clears throat> there's a lot of setup here we're basically just talking about the planes that they're going to invade and um for some reason that it, they admit a little bit that they're not giving us all of the details here, yeah. but they want to send each planeswalker to either invade their home plane or a plane that's like special to them. Mm -hmm. So um, they first send Nahiri to 
Zendikar, and they'll kind of go one at a time. And the main purpose of this is like, hey, readers, these are the planes that are getting yeah. attacked. And this and is what we're here's in... who's leading the charge in each one. Yeah. And it's kind of like Nahiri, are there some cool things on your plane that we could take? And she's like, oh, the hedrons, like that's a thing that we might use. And they're like, cool, go get the hedrons. Luca, where are you from? He's like, oh, this thing. Oh, cool. Go to Acoria and get some beasts, I guess. Um, yeah. Oh, the funny thing was Luca is like, <laughs> he was like, yes. She was like, Luca, how do you plan on invading? He's like, yes, I shall invade. She's like, yeah, I fucking know Luca. Yeah. How? <laughs> and he's like, uh, the monsters. And she's like, wow, this guy's going to fail. All right, Luca, go get the monsters. And you she, tell me when yeah. you're done. And she was also like, <laughs> if he doesn't come back, uh, whatever. That's not so bad. I don't really care. Yeah. Um, so so <laughs> I like that interaction. Yeah. Just like, yeah. Luca, Luca sucks. Even Luca sucks. Like everyone fucking hates Luca. Uh, yeah. All the readers do. Like all the other planeswalkers, <laughs> even Elish Nord. Like, let's just get him dead or something. I don't know. Yeah, but like, just whatever. Go, go. But just go. Go do that. Um, yeah. And then we have. Oh, and then um, uh, Tamio goes to Kamigawa because, mm -hmm. of course, that's where she's from uh then they have a good talk with a johnny um and where he's gonna go and he's like thinking of like, oh i should go back to dominaria and blah blah or these different things and she's like no actually i want you to go to theros and he's like mm -hmm. interesting why would that be uh and jeff why would that why would you want to go to theros what do they have there that would be really helpful and strong and cool uh well they have something called gods so Whoa. the stated reason that she gave a Johnny or that he figured out on his own and she said was correct is that uh, she wants him to complete the gods. And he mentions that on Theros, the way it works is the gods are like um, embodiments of devotion. Mm -hmm. So if people believe in them enough, that's how they actually manifest. So he's saying if you complete enough of their devotees that essentially completes the god because they're create they'll like manifest in the image of their believers yeah which is number one i did not know this before here reading it here and mm -hmm. that makes the original theros gods so flavorful and so fucking cool yeah the devotion mechanic oh. you know jumped up a little bit and like i was like that is really awesome so his plan is that he's going to go there and kind of infiltrate all the the followers and make them believe that uh the phyrexian like being completed is is much better or like mm -hmm. will actually save them i guess and that makes the gods really weak and so then you can take them over and they will do basically the gods will do whatever the followers tell them or want them to yeah if the if the followers are imagining them as completed mm -hmm. they will be completed essentially gotcha okay um, that was a little bit different than what i was thinking but that makes a lot more sense um yeah. i like that so essentially you just have to convert i don't know if it's exactly 50 percent, but sounds mm -hmm. like you just have to convert 50 percent of the followers and then 51 <laughs> percent, and then boom 50 yeah, yeah 50.1 uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah there we go um so that seems pretty good i do like the bit where um, Elish Norn's having him guess what he's going to be doing there. And it is that yeah. kind of that joke that's been going around the internet. That's like, you know, when you ask your, your partner where they want to go to dinner, and yeah. they're always yeah. like, oh, do you want sushi? Do you want pizza? Do you want that? And like, no, 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 I don't want any of those things. Instead of doing that, you should just be like, uh, all right, we're going to go out, out to dinner. And they're like, oh, where are we going? You're like, guess. And then mm -hmm. wherever they guess, that's where you take them like, oh you're right that's exactly where we're gonna go um yeah. so that they, they feel good it kind of feels like Elish Norton almost had a little bit of that with the Johnny <laughs> yes so, you're gonna complete yeah, the gods hey that's a really good plan yeah you oh, I didn't that. even think of that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh which is great Although um she does say something in her like internal monologue or maybe it was about Atraxa right yeah this, oh yeah this kind of comes up later but it's not really the reason she's sending a Johnny there. It's like the decoy reason for a Johnny. Like she wants it done, mm -hmm. but she's sending a Johnny there for actually a more important purpose that he, and she says he will complete it even without knowing that that's why he's there. Mm -hmm. 
which seems to be some of the things that she's kind of doing in these places. And you just brought up Atraxa, so we should bring her up as well. Uh, mm -hmm. This is our angel Phyrexian. And she is now headed to New Capena. So, um, and her mission is kind of, it, it has a similar tone of like, we know that uh, New Capena was Phyrexia at some point or Phyrexianized. We don't exactly know if that's the where Phyrexia was or their real history, but we do know that that plane has its roots in Phyrexia and New Capena, the, um, the city is what they, the people built on top of it after the angels sacrificed themselves to help the demons right. um, make the city. So there are still Phyrexians there and Atraxa thinks that she's going to like uh, save them or bring them up so that they can fight everyone. But that's not exactly what um, Eloshnorn wants because she's pissed that those Phyrexians couldn't have done that the she whole time. She was like, no, they're weak. Why would we, like they lost. Why would we want them? Yeah, they've been there for so long. They haven't even done anything. So they're useless. I mean, at us. the rate technology advances, like she's right, they gotta be yeah. outdated by now. Definitely. Um, so it's something to do with the angels, actually. I'm a little, Jeff, do you know a little bit more about this? I was a little shaky. I know we're going to talk about it more later in the episode, but. Um, yeah, I think it's sort of intentionally vague as to exactly the thing. But like, like you said, the angels sacrificed themselves to fight off the original, either Phyrexian invasion or Phyrexian presence that was there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what leads to Halo. That That's what created Halo. Mm -hmm. Um it's like angel dust. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like and, blue liquid, but whatever. Um, and that effect is still there to some extent, but Atraxa is an angel mm -hmm. or was an angel before being completed. So I think it would to hit like basically what they're saying is I'm sending you because you will be sort of immune to that effect, given that you are an angel. Are an angel. Yeah so that makes sense um so great we'll see how that's going in a little bit and then through all of this um uh this is the whole chapter is just her talking to people about where they're going um and then somehow Tyvar, kaito and kaya escaped um which we knew was going to happen um i think it happens earlier in it but like it's it doesn't really seem like a big plot point it's just like yeah i knew they were going to leave and they left at some point. They left. And yeah. we're just kind of like bogged down by just like some feels almost bureaucratic, like uh, uh, you need to go do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. <laughs> Literally is like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like she's a manager and is doing her like weekly planning. Like, okay, yeah. you're going to do this this week. This is your schedule. Do... Yeah. So this is your shift and your shift and you're picking up this person's <laughs> shift. It's, yeah. <laughs> Elish Norn, the, uh, the restaurant manager. Um, yeah. So they have escaped, and now Elish Norn is alone with Nissa, who Nissa is busy moving. Oh, because all every time we've been talking about the different planes, Nissa has been moving the Realm Breaker so we can see it better. Mm -hmm. um, so Nissa is busy doing Realm Breaker stuff, and apparently too quiet, which Elish Norn does not enjoy the silence for whatever reason. Yeah. So, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I just love that she does this. <laughs> Do you want to <laughs> explain it? Or yeah. So she like <laughs> she basically has like all has she's connected her mind to all the Phyrexians. She has them just say what she's thinking. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> so she hears her own thoughts from like a throng of disciples yeah like just saying like man i really wish nissa would fucking say something <laughs> yeah i'd say it's so weird it's like you know what <laughs> it's too quiet all of you just say what uh, we're we're thinking or i'm thinking so yeah. weird um <laughs> uh but while that is happening there is one sentence about a figure in a white cloak that is stalking her from far away and sees all this happening so this uh is a yep could be anyone could be anyone um i, I we're, we're never gonna see them again i'm sure that was just yeah. like a random one-off sentence yeah i'm sure that's just like 
in there for no reason. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I will say about this one, you know, it's obviously set up. It's all set up, the entire yeah. chapter. Um, I didn't mind it, though, as far mm-hmm. as all set up chapters go. Uh, other than a couple of the early points that I, I didn't understand the Shieldred thing because I didn't read that, I don't think. And uh, it was really like, it really did just feel like they needed a way that Tyvar, Kaito, and Kaya could possibly escape. The only way that makes any sense is that Elishorn lets them go. So there's some sort of half-assed reason that Elishnorn lets them go. Yeah. If she, like, even just, uh, whatever. It doesn't really matter, yeah. But otherwise, I appreciated that we got to see something from the point of view of a Phyrexian, because mm-hmm. to my knowledge, we've never really had that, like, other than brief, brief, like, paragraphs or them saying to the protagonist, like, mm-hmm. what they're thinking. And what struck me was that there's like more, there's more emotion than mm-hmm. what they depict. I feel like in all the old writings of Phyrexia, everything they say is like, must complete. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, okay, cool. They're robots. They just have one task. But Elish Norn like gets annoyed by certain things that people do or say, has favorites that she picks mm-hmm. that isn't entirely based on their usefulness. It's mostly based on that, but not entirely. Yeah. And like, you know, it was too quiet at the end, so she just needed to generate some noise. Did a weird, freaky thing. Yeah. And I thought that was cool because, like, I've always kind of wondered that about Phyrexians. Like, they are cyborgs, right? Like, they also are still partially flesh. Mm-hmm. They're just, you know, prefer the metal, like the, mm-hmm. you know, robot side of themselves. But I was always like, isn't there some, like, humanity left in some of these people? Um, and I think part of the author's goal with this was to show that, yes, that like these, the Phyrexians still have some humanity in them later, which is good, particularly important for the planeswalkers who have been mm-hmm. converted. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, it makes you wonder, are they totally lost causes or not? I'm not totally sure. Which has been a thread for, <clears throat> since we have seen the planeswalkers completed, which is over a year right. now. That has been the thread. Like, if anyone could retain their humanity against Mm -hmm. the and be brought back, it probably would be one of the planeswalkers. Yeah, because it hasn't been as long for them. Um, I agree with that, and it also makes sense that you were saying you didn't think that all the oneness and like all that that has been hammered really home in this chapter, probably Mm -hmm. because it's Elish Norn who's talking, and so we hear a bunch of it. Uh, And it didn't. I, I thought the author did a great job. And I did enjoy sitting in Elish Norn's uh, kind of shoes and, and feeling it, uh, even though it is kind of our setup chapter. It was nice. Yeah. Big win on just everyone hates Luca. That was just hilarious. Boom. To me. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> All right. We are moving into episode number two, Holding Your Breath. So we are going to jump over to Chandra over on Dominaria. So we are in her point of view from this chapter. Uh, And I do like how they do this where we jump from uh, people's points of view. That is helpful. Uh, Some other stories were just stuck with one person the whole time and uh, don't always love that. So, Mm -hmm. uh, which were- Especially when you get stuck with a dud, you know? Yeah, you're like, oh man. Like some people are just boring characters, wizards. We don't need Mm -hmm. entire chapters from their point of view. Yeah, like Teo, who they- (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, who's- just whatever we don't need Teo. we don't need a novel from Teo's perspective but, um, <laughs> yeah. it, i guess whatever that's that's a whole nother episode i don't even that's, that's a different drunken vorthos yeah sorry which we're never gonna do so anyway <laughs> uh <laughs> until i make jeff read war of the spark and i then force God. myself to read it again uh but <laughs> anyway we're in dominaria with chandra and we are waiting at the safe house um because the plan was that there's a safe house in dominaria that is like it's Liliana's like manor that she's also like rebuilding. It's like the Vess manor. It's like her family house. And um, yeah, this got destroyed in the um, Emrakul invasion, I think. Or was it even more on Dominaria? Than that? Well, I don't think Emrakul. Oh in yes, Dominaria. it's not on. Uh, it's not on Innistrad. It's not on Innistrad. It was destroyed after years of like battles, and uh, it was already in ruins when we went there for Dominaria the set. 
um, okay. not United, but the other one. So, and that was like the first time she had been back in years. So it was kind of like, it just from being in a war zone, it just. Okay, gosh. Gotcha. I thought like, it was like, I think she had some castle in Innistrad that got totaled at some point. Maybe. Um, but anyway, I think this is her family home because she's from Dominaria originally. Right. Um, and uh, anyway, so their plan was that they were going to wait two weeks. And if they heard a word from anyone, then they would um, do whatever the people tell them. But if two weeks go by, no one says anything. They expect the worst. All of them are dead. And they plan an invasion or whatever their their plan is. But Chandra uh, voices that she hates waiting and sitting around and that it sucks, which is true. Yeah, it does kind of suck. Yeah, in typical Chandra fashion, they were just like, I don't know what why this always happens, but I feel like the authors are compelled to tell us just way too many times that Chandra is antsy. Mm -hmm. It's like, I get it. But I think they write that way because they're trying to reflect how she's feeling and like, yeah. like portray it, not just with words, but in emotion. But I'm always like, okay, like, I get it. Like, there, I've read books where this happens too, where I'm just like, okay, it's like teenage angst or you know, he's, this person's annoyed, but I just, let's, let's move on. <laughs> yeah, The point has been made on that. Well, the thing about that is that it makes you feel annoyed with the angst specifically where they yeah. bring it up all the time. It just constantly is there. It's like, I hate being in this person and around this person. And that's yeah. exactly how they're feeling. And that's why it sucks. And it's just like, this is not fun. And like, like maybe this. it's making me feel that way intentionally. Like, I think it is right. But it's like, doesn't mean I love it. Yeah, I don't think that this uh, chapter is is actually doing that. But but um, just the first like two or three paragraphs. And then there was one moment where it was like Chandra comma who hates waiting i was like oh my oh, fucking god yeah yeah it's true. <laughs> oh right i do remember that yeah um so anyway it's very well established that chandra doesn't like to wait and uh so she's talking to ren about um trying to keep their fire under control now this is my question for you is mm -hmm. ren on fire does ren have fire what is going on i'm very confused I thought Chandra was trying to teach pyromancy to Ren and Re so Ren was like a student oh. trying to control a flame and she was doing a mediocre to bad job and Chandra was trying to like teach her I just thought that something happened with one of Ren's like <clears throat> when she like merged with Seven then she had like because she kind of in her art she has like red here and it's I couldn't tell if it is fire or what or what like her it's first like card is red queen and I yeah. always imagined the tree was green and she was red, red green, um, or red. But her new card, her then next card was green. green. So who knows? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I yeah. For some reason, I, I thought that she was on fire, and then she it was like crazy, and then Chandra's just, just bored, and like the lights are on fire. I'm like, let me help you with that. <laughs> well, I, I was more so thinking <laughs> that I I had missed something, and and Ren has just been on fire forever. I yeah, it wasn't super well explained. Like in all that part of her being antsy could have maybe said to heal her boredom she tried to teach red pyromancy or yeah something. Or, or something like that it just it just kind of assumed that we knew that ren had fire and i was like i didn't know if it, was it also could be another side story because there was a ren side story right in what recently that i didn't read maybe we should be reading the side stories i guess so <laughs> before we <laughs> just so much more drunken borthos is coming your way it's true um uh, my interpretation was that mostly because it was like, it made sense to me that Chandra would be like, I'm super bored, Ren. Do you want to learn how to make fire? That makes sense. And yeah. They sit down and like, Ren's like, okay, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and we know that Ren is like a great friend and we can talk to Ren about everyone likes talking to Ren because, uh, yeah. It, uh, I'm sure a good secret keeper because she barely talks. So, um, right. kind of a kind of good thing. So their friendship is becoming stronger, um, just through this literal boredom because Liliana is like off uh I think she's like working on rebuilding her manor and she's using this time to like renovate and so it's yeah. kind of like she's having her HGTV show and everyone else is yeah. just waiting around uh which they're are... all like Liliana the end of the world is coming she's like yeah hold on I gotta do my bathroom yeah and it's <laughs> it's basically like Liliana and I'm sure that she has like raised a bunch of zombies to be her like construction workers so it's yeah. kind of it's like the property brothers but they're all zombies 
Uh, <laughs> I'm sure. Anyway, um, that gets cut short. Uh, thank God. Uh, and then we get um, our three worms uh, come back from uh, New Phyrexia to explain yeah. what has happened. Yeah. Um, now, this is a sad part, of course, because um, I don't want to say the people who were waiting in the safe house were disappointed by the people who returned, <laughs> but uh, like, uh, it really feels like they were like, wow, you three are the ones that survived. Because well, well, they, they show up and they're like, uh, Liliana's immediate like, oh, you know, I'm sure Jace is late as always, you know, he's coming soon. Mm -hmm. And they, like, Kaya kind of looks at Tyvar and they're like, uh... So the thing about Jace, yeah. he kind of, uh, I don't know, he's completed, he's dead, he's gone. Yeah, he and they're is, like, what are you talking yeah. about? They're like, well, Elspeth did kind of stab him with a sword. And then he kind of <laughs> got completed. So, yeah, he's done. Right. And then they're like, well, okay, great. So Elspeth's okay, right? And they're like, well... well... <laughs> <laughs> She stabbed Jace because he was going to blow everything up, and she took the bomb and planes walked away. Yeah. So probably not doing great either. I think she's also gone. And then <laughs> Chandra can just, like, feel that, like, she's waiting and waiting and waiting to hear about Nyssa because they're um, best friends slash lovers. Um, yeah. Like, ex-girlfriends and kind of, kind of coming back to it now uh, that Nyssa had chosen to be part of the Gatewatch again in Dominaria United um and uh just to set us up for this crushing disappointment yeah so they had to break the news to chandra which she did she was not happy about that was she funny. didn't take it well no 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 not at all so um and we know she has a fiery temper so um she's kind of upset about that and she um immediately starts talking about how they need to like planeswalk there right now and to go fight Elishnor and, and like stop her which the three of them are like no <laughs> don't fucking do that that's yeah. dumb the like three that have already been there are like is... I don't think you understand yeah what it's like over there it's really <laughs> gross honestly um yeah. and they're also like horribly beaten up which I did think it was interesting that Liliana of all people is the one healing them like mm -hmm. because if you know anything about Liliana, uh, she, she tried to be a healer. She tried to be a healer, and then she gave her brother some poison, and he died. And that is how her spark got ignited. So I I don't really want to see like if I'm in it, if I'm hurt, I could stay away from Liliana. That's just that's just no, the that's, thing is if you. If she poisons you by accident and you die, she could bring you back. Uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> the ultimate exactly. combo, like terrible healer plus necromancer. Yeah, is, this is how she funds her construction for her. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> She's like, she just oh, you're not feeling friends. well? Here, take this. Here, take this. <laughs> yeah, try some of that. You um, look strong. Yeah, yeah, drink this. I would trust Ren much more. I'd be like, no, no, no Liliana, thank you. But no, thank you. <laughs> Ren, what do you got go going for me? Do you have something? Yeah, could you just uh, cast a heal? Whatever you got. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was that was fun because, well, you know, just sounds like a bad idea. Um, but we go into an immediate fight between everyone of like, well, between everyone. It's really Chandra wants to go to Phyrexia immediately, right now, and go fight them. Mm -hmm. And everyone else says, fuck that plan. Let's go tell everyone in the multiverse what's going on so we can make an army and, and then fight. Uh, which yeah. Chandra doesn't like because she thinks that she can save Nyssa, I guess, if she goes right now. I don't know. That sounds like a dumb plan. But... Yeah, I mean, she was also saying, like, we can go there and gather our armies and wait to die, but like if we don't cut them off at the source or do something right 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 based on what we hear about the size of their army and the like it is a huge disadvantage that every person that you lose fight starts to fight against you i don't know how you ever beat an army like that mm -hmm. but um it's true so she's kind of right on the other hand they just sent a team of planeswalkers and the three that came back are like the weakest ones only because Alish Norn didn't care enough about them. To take them, so, yeah, that's right. Like I don't know even... how about just running right back in there. Yeah, because yeah, I guess her, either. 
her plan is to go and blow up the realm breaker which yeah. chandra has the ability to because she is like a bomb um because she can just burn everything i don't know why she didn't go in the first place she seems like a great backup plan to the silex but whatever um <laughs> uh so it's anyway too dangerous to let her yeah. get completed yeah she wants to go chop down the tree um and uh, Liliana just wants to go to um, Arcavios, which is uh, Strixhaven, uh, so that she can warn them about what's going on. Uh, but of course, they don't agree, and Liliana just planes walks away as they're in mid argument, uh, equivalent to hanging up the phone. So yeah, yeah, yeah. She slams the phone for sure. Mm -hmm. um, or I guess uh, in modern day, just just pushes the button but, but you used to really yeah you know, have you know then you don't really get enough you need something you even flip phones the, were pretty good yeah. yeah even the slide was like kind of okay but like yeah this i guess you get these days never know you really never only know. get one is what it is is that like you you have to throw it on the ground and break your phone <laughs> and that's the true yeah that's how you know someone yeah. someone's really angry not only <laughs> am i hanging up on you but you can't contact me anymore because i broke my phone <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there you go um anyway that's so, what really happened then. that's what she did so uh though technically i guess chandra could just go after her but she doesn't anyway um so she's really sad and um ren comes over this is my Ren. <laughs> yeah, apparently. <laughs> this is my Ren. Ren is a robot. Just not a. <laughs> okay, sorry. What What is a tree? How does a tree move? I don't know. Anyway. So, yeah, it's an ant, I suppose. Yeah, it's like they, an ant. They're not the most Much agile. Yeah. Anyway. Um, and Ren goes over to cheer her up because Ren thinks the same thing. Ren yeah. was like, hey, I don't think your plan is dumb. Mm hmm. Although she then suggests a plan that might actually have a chance at working. Yeah. Um, where she says, hey, I was thinking, Realm Breaker's a big ass tree. And I can take over trees and like bond with them and convince them Did you know, you see, not to yeah. invade planes and stuff. And they're like, huh, uh, that does make sense. And well, Ren's it makes also more like, sense than me just running in there and trying to shoot fire at stuff. So. That's true. Also, <laughs> Ren decides that, uh, hey, maybe we should get Teferi because he's a pretty strong guy. Uh, we mm -hmm. should have him, which I don't know what's going on. Well, Teferi is like often like he's lost on some place with a beach. That's what we know. Um, th maybe there's more that has come out, but that's all I know uh, from mm -hmm. the, the stories. And um, so they're like, oh, let's go find him and he can come help us. And they're like, oh, that seems cool uh spoiler alert they don't do this but uh, it was some talked about and it seemed like it's it like no like rent yeah rent says something like i know he'll be there and seems to have like a reason that yeah. they'll that he'll help them out at some point like he he'll just arrive i guess yeah i don't know it's one of those it's just whatever um but uh anyway we have that kind of closure and they both decide, yes, we are going to go to New Phyrexia and take over the Realm Breaker. Sick. Yeah. And Ren does mention they can like, because you're wondering if the Realm Breaker is even a freaking tree. Like, how good is this planet? Is it mm -hmm. completely metal or whatever? She says that she can hear it, even yeah. though it's so far. Like, she can, she, trees have songs or something and she can hear its song. Right. Oh, yeah. The song thing again. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. When she's and that's to like assure the reader that this plan isn't just super pointless because yeah, yeah. it still feels super pointless. But that's just me. Yeah. But... It's better than no plan, which is what they had thirty seconds before this. That's true. Thing. I think through a lot of the story, you will realize that not having a plan and then choosing just whatever plan they have, they think is better. I don't, I don't, I don't, it's not always better. Um, sometimes it's like, that's a stupid plan. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. That's dumb. Yeah. But there's one, one in particular that I'm thinking about that we'll get to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, this closes out this chapter. And of course, at the end, there are some watchers watching um, and they are waiting for the beginning of the end. So, 
Mm. Yeah. I wonder what that's going to be. Uh, <clears throat> but yes, Jeff, do you have any um, thoughts about these two chapters before we go on our beer break and get to the rest of them? Yeah, like I said, I liked episode one. Uh, the only thing that I don't know if we mentioned is there was a point when Jace just goes off and does something because he can obviously read Delish Norn's mind, so she doesn't have to actually tell him to do stuff. Oh, I think I missed that completely. I just didn't understand what was happening. Yeah, there's a place, there's a point in there where Jace just walks off and Elish Norn's like, of course, I don't have to tell him what I need him to oh, do. Oh, right, right, right. Okay, I do remember that now. And so <laughs> that's like a coy way of keeping secret what Jace <laughs> is doing from the reader. Well, this is funny because <laughs> that happened and then I just thought it was because he was completed. I was like, well, all the completed planeswalkers. Yeah, they all know. They all know. <laughs> oh, and... see, I was like, oh, he's a mind mage. So he yeah. knows. <laughs> but, and I was thinking like, oh, we're all one. We all work together. She's been harping yeah. on it the whole time. I was like, everyone should just be able to do that. And that's why I completely forgot about it because it seems not special anymore. Um, yeah. Now I wonder if it does like joining the hive mind just totally make Chase's power useless. Because yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> Cause, like I you guess make he it... can read his opponent's minds, but yeah. But then yeah. But he can make illusions, but like everyone knows it's an illusion besides the people who aren't part of the hive mind. But not right. nearly as powerful <laughs> without that. But anyway, that is the end of chapter number two, and we're gonna go on a beer break and. Jump back in for the rest of them. Boom, boom. All right. Cheers. All righty. So as you can see from the label, if you're on YouTube, um, our next beer of the night is Old Style Pilsner. It is a Pilsner from Canada. And it is 5%, I believe. I think it was made in 1926. And um, previously, Jeff gave this a silver two, and I gave this a silver three. So apparently not my favorite. This is kind of like, if you haven't had old style Pilsner, um, sometimes it replaces like the PBR in bars. Yeah. It's kind of like the cheapest beer you can get at a bar, but uh, the can actually looks pretty cool. Um, if you, I don't, The reason I want to show you this is because I guess not everyone knows this beer. But um, because I yeah, I think it's I was, Canadian. It's Canadian. I was new to it when I moved here, but um, that's kind of the the place it holds sometimes. Yeah, even though we that's a good have. comparison. It's like the the cheapest beer you can get typically. Yeah, typically, um, so very like kind of hipster cool. People have tattoos of the little bunny and stuff. So. It, exactly. Yeah, it's that hipster cool PBR yeah. vibe, but the Canadian version. Yeah. And actually, to be honest, much cooler than PBR. So anyway, all right, cheers. Here we go. Mm. Okay, we are jumping right back into things. So this is episode three, Mother, Son, and Story. We are with Tamio on Kamigawa, and she is fucking some shit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is a weird one, guys. So yeah, uh, strap just... yourself in. Um, I she starts by uh, she's floating in the air and she has a scroll opened and she's reading the story of Urza, the Brothers War, Karn, Mirden, Memnark, and then of course New Phyrexia and how all that happens. And as she's reading it, the scroll starts to be covered in oil, like um. It starts to be, I think, seeping from her hands almost as she's watching it and like it's covering some of the letters and they start to shine through with like, I was imagining like a kind of neon, like purple shining through this black oil. Um, so she keeps being able to read it, uh, which is interesting. And while this is happening, she is, it's wreaking havoc on um, the actual plane of Kamigawa. Like the earth is splitting apart. Buildings are collapsing. Uh, Boseju splits, and it's like oil is spewing out of it. Um, so, yeah. so we're just full on like <clears throat> in an invasion, right? Now. Yes. Like we've transitioned. Pyrexian invasions are fully underway. There's mm -hmm. like these huge, you know, Pyrexian juggernauts just taking things out left, right, and center. 
Um, this does quickly remind me something I wanted to say in uh, chapter one. But I can't remember if we actually said or not, but I don't, I don't think so. There's a point in chapter one when Elishnorn is telling Tamio what she's going to do. And Tamio like zones out because she's watching Kamigawa and ignores Elishnorn's command. And Atraxa like flies up and beats her wings and like makes a huge fuss to like, oh, right. snap Tamio back in. And then she's like, you know, that's unacceptable. You were given a command. Mm -hmm. And then Elish Norn repeats and sends her on her way. So I think there was a bit of a hint that like part of the Tamio that loves Kamigawa is still there a little bit because she was like entranced by looking at Kamigawa and seeing right. what was happening. Um, which that part is not in control at this moment because she is wreaking havoc on this place. I did forget that Tamio's power is like scroll reading. Right. So her spells are in scroll. So this story that she's telling, and she tells stories and writes stories down. So as she tells the story, uh, it has it's a story of destruction. And so she's destroying um, the plane and turning it into basically Phyrexia. Her point is, um, as she looks down on all the things, especially all the Kami that are dying and all the people, um, just seeing how the Kami and the all the different types of uh, people that live on Kamigawa have been fighting for so long that uh, if they're all completed, they will be one and they'll be part of the same family and that fighting mm -hmm. will stop and it will actually bring peace if we get to do this. And so she's bringing peace to this plane by completing all these people. Pretty good point. I actually liked this. Um, mm -hmm. That was something that like it is the, I don't know, the cool thing when like the villain has a plan that like makes sense to people and you're like, ah, oh, in like a fucked up way, that's actually, that will right. be better. Um, but it's hard to like thread that needle of it's obviously evil, mm -hmm. but like, it's kind of a good point though. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it, in a lot of stories, it's like two people that want the same thing, but their tactics are so different. Right. Um, and one person refused to do certain things. The other person will do anything to get it, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, but I like that. That was good. I, I feel like that's pretty strong. Um, and, and really applies to like all of the planes. They all, yeah. I mean, they're magic planes. So they have infighting because otherwise the magic set would be super boring. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because every set, you know, has that like, there's somebody who's trying to do something we don't want. And we're going to fight them. And then blah, blah, and there's a bunch of cards that show fighting or whatever, because you need combat tricks and you need, you just, it has to be part of the set. It's That's a game about works. combat, so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, unless you're a combo player. Anyway, um, so uh, we cut over to Kaya, who is in Kamigawa, and she's trying to stem the bleeding. So she sees a small boy and his dog, and they're trapped under some rubble from this apartment building. And uh, she jumps to try to save them. And it looks like the dog has enough space to get to squeeze out, but the boy can't. And so Kaya sticks her arm in and grabs him and pulls him out using her ghost stuff, um, which apparently this is really hard. I, it seemed like it took more, more strain for her to do this than I would normally imagine. I think it's a lot easier for her to just like face through things herself, but bringing other yeah. people who aren't, who don't know that they're going to do it is more difficult or stressful for her yeah um, and then i think it was like so it's hard for her to phase other people through things um like like you said who aren't expecting it but mm -hmm. then she did mention because he wants to it's doable it's it's doable like i can't just i think they're just making the point like just for oh why doesn't kind of just do this all the time mm -hmm. i can't make someone like face through something that they don't want to yeah um but if they are willing to go with me, it's doable. Yeah, like, and she's done that in the past with other uh, planeswalkers and stuff. But it's not like she she can't just take grab Elish Norn and pull her into the ground and then let go and then she's like stuck phase in. her through and she just falls or something. Yeah, like, it, like yeah. that that can't happen. So um, I guess this is a little point showing us that. Um, and then as that's all happening, um, Kaito is talking with. Um, Kaya, because he's also there. And um, they're watching up and seeing that Tamio is the reason all of this is happening. And then both him and Kaya are like, this is 
fucked up and obviously the worst person that we would ever want to see destroying Kamigawa. Um, we got a killer, right? We got a killer. And they're like, yep, let's fucking kill her. They're like, okay. And Kaito's like, I will do it. And while that's happening, Kaya's like, well, shouldn't the Wanderer be here? Where the fuck is the Wandering Emperor? Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and Kaito's like, just, she'll be here, okay? Just give, yeah. have some faith. She, she'll be here. <laughs> Yeah, I like that interaction. So, yeah, they like kind of jumps off with the little boy. I don't know what the plan was, but they jump and then they don't make the jump. And Kaito saves them with telekinesis. So he's like, saved you. Um, and then they're in this interaction, right? And I love how Kaya says, All right, one of us should go kill Tamiyo. Do you want to do it or should I? And Kaito's like, yeah, it's, it's personal. I should do it. Um, <laughs> just like you said, well, where the fuck's the Wanderer? Shouldn't she be helping us? And so this is just like, why did that annoy him so much when I yeah. said that? <laughs> it's like he got really mad, which I mean, I guess makes sense. If your best friend slash love of your life like phases yeah. in and out of planes constantly, um, I mean, <laughs> She was basically like, where's your girlfriend, bro? Shouldn't she yeah. be helping? Yeah, <laughs> she's like a much better fighter than you. He's like, shut <laughs> the fuck up, okay? I could do stuff too. I could make drones, you know? Yeah. Creatures draw cards when they know. hit players. We yeah. all know she's right. Yeah. yeah. There are standard decks revolving around all the copies of the Wandering Emperor, and there are, there are no copies of Kaito <laughs> instead. So, um, but anyway, um, the way he's going to get up there is going to he's going to climb up Baseju, who Baseju has split up and it's dying, but it isn't completely done yet. I guess I was thinking that that was like the biggest thing that you could destroy. Like Baseju endures, and it is not enduring right now. Mm -hmm. um, but True. It's, that's a good point of why they chose this to. Yeah, because it survives the city around it, and it grew on top of it. So this is the worst thing that could kind of happen. Um, but it's still tall enough that it can get up to Tamio. So Kaito's mm -hmm. climbing up the tree branches. And um, as he's doing that, he runs into... Who is it, Jeff? Well, of course, it's Nashi. And if you don't remember who Nashi is... <laughs> if some, for some reason, you don't remember who Nashi is, Nashi yeah. is, is, is Tamio's rat son. Mm-hmm. They prefer Nazumi. Really need I believe. any more explanation than that? I believe. Yeah, it's her rat baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, the perfect person to run into as you're going to try to kill their mother is the their child. Mm -hmm. um, Who, by the way, is there because he thinks he can bring his mom out of her. Uh, temporary insanity as he sees it yeah so he saw what she was doing he's wearing like a kind of uh get up he has like I, I think some sort of like biker helmet or kind of like uh some armor he's a small child who likes tinkering he with scraps things. together whatever yeah. he could find um and he just sounds so adorable <laughs> yeah and he hasn't seen her in a while and it was pretty sad when she got completed and like stolen and this is the first time he's seeing her as the way that she is. And he believes he can get through to her. Now, Kaito didn't have a plan. And his plan, well, it was basically go try to kill her. And now he's like, well, now nah, she's here. And he's asking, pretty please, can I go try to talk to my mommy? And so Kaito says, sure, let's try. Okay. <laughs> yeah, maybe she's in there. This is the thing with these. It's so frustrating because it's like, every character is going through the same shit constantly and it's like oh a johnny no we can talk to him it'll be fine oh blah 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 this person it'll be fine we can go talk to him nissa i'm gonna go talk to her it's it's just they're gone they're gone mm -hmm. it's it's just I, we i'm tired of it happening over and over again and it's going to continue to happen in more stories i know it so Anyway, yeah, it was Kaito I was annoyed with here. It's like, really, you're gonna take the kid up so that he can get killed by his mom, like yeah. crazy <laughs> cyborg mother. I understand. Just kick him, give him a little kick, and then go kill his mom. Come on, Kaito. I feel like like 
I understand that the dramatic, that what, what seems dramatic is that the son goes up to the mom and tries to get her to, to see him and she doesn't. But I also think it's really dramatic where Kaito's pushing him away and gets up higher and doesn't help him climb the tree. Because, spoiler alert, Nashi can't even climb the tree. Like, Paseju, so, so <laughs> yeah. like, Kaito has to help him with, like, a drone. It's a giant tree. tree that's covered in oil. It's hard to climb. That's true. But he's a rat. I don't know. Anyway, um, so he has to, like, use this, like, drone and some telekinesis, I think, to help him up the tree. So, like, Kaito's really doing everything. I think it's a bit more of a moment if you like you have to have Kaya hold the rat back. Sorry, Nashi. That sounds so awful. <laughs> like hold Nashi back while he's like crying and like they're saying like no, it's for your own good. You can't go up there. I'm not letting you. Like forces him down and then Nashi has to watch from afar. I think that feels more dramatic to me, but um mm -hmm. anyway, they decided to do this and that's not what happens at all. Uh Nashi does go up to the top of the tree and with Kaito and tries to reason with the completed tamia yeah um and it goes as you'd expect mm -hmm. tamio says oh dashi i would love to complete you <laughs> yep and nashi doesn't know what that means but also was like no like come back to us blah 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 whatever it doesn't work it's it, it like it stops working immediately and tamio tries oh, to yeah. him, get him with whatever something um yeah it's anyway uh so kaito has to save nashi from the the onslaught that now tamio is, is like pointing towards nashi and so now he is fighting tamio to keep her away from him because obviously that's a stupid fucking plan why did we even try it nashi could have died like i don't yeah. i don't know I, I i'll try to stop harping on it but that's that was one of the plans I thought was really dumb. Um, as they are. Anyway, sorry, Jeff, what would you like to say? You can you can talk. <laughs> um, no, I completely agree. I was I was just like, oh, obviously Kaito's gonna shut this down. No, no, he's gonna carry him up the tree. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this is pretty dumb. Um, it puts him in a really compromised position to start off his fight against Tamio. And I think Kaito kind of sucks anyway. So Tamio like Sort of easily beats him and he blames it on like slipping on the oil of the oil. tree or something <laughs> no she got you with the whole scroll around your foot thing I yeah. guess. so she like indiana jones whips him into the air and so yeah. he's like hanging upside down by a scroll she threw a bunch of like shards at him he was blocking and then she like fucking lassoed his foot and... yeah <laughs> and so now he's hanging upside down by a scroll <laughs> And he's debating in his head, if I cut the scroll, it's a really long fall and I might die. <laughs> but if I don't cut the scroll, then she's going to kill me. Guess I got to cut the scroll. And so then. And at some point she like slashed through his armor and was like, lucky that didn't get me. And then one of the like bolts hit his face or something. But then after he's like, oh man, if I didn't lose my footing slightly, you know, I could have easily won this fight. It's like, dude, you're getting your ass kicked from no. day one. Like this was never going your way, man. No. Uh, yeah, Kaito's not, he's kind of not, he's not the best. Um, yeah. Let's just put it that way. In his other stories, he's also not the best. So this is actually good uh, to keep in line. Um, right. Though he can take oil off of your body, so that's good. Um, anyway, uh, so he decides to cut the scroll and figure out how to not die from the land later. But right as he does that, guess who comes to save the day? Teferi! Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was obviously Kyodai. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So it's uh, Kaiodai and the Wanderer. Um, yeah, so obviously they referenced it earlier, sort of a little foreshadowing that the Wandering Emperor was going to appear at some point. Because he has and, faith, yeah. And come on, she had to. Yeah. So she does. She saves Kaito, and mm -hmm. she is there with Kaiodai, which is like the great spirit, the great Kami uh, yeah. protector. Mm -hmm. um, that she has a bond with because she's the emperor. Yep. Um, 
and now the Wanderer is fighting with Tamio. Um, so uh, she's Tamio's like I don't know what she's shooting. She's been throwing like bolts or like quivers or something or quills. Yeah, um, I don't know what it is, but it's like this. And um, I was imagining like actual quills because it's Tamio, like mm -hmm. feathers that you write with. Yeah, yeah. Like... <laughs> it's something like that um because we do talk about it later i think but anyway so she's throwing her quails i guess and uh the wanderer is doing a really good job of dodging them it doesn't seem to be that difficult and then um she slashes a bit and then in classic wanderer fashion she exiles her and then gains two life um, <laughs> that's right <laughs> that's totally what happens <laughs> yeah she just straight up flash of light slash through tamio and she splits in half falls apart and Tamio's fucking dead. And her son had to watch that from a very mm. close vantage. Thank you to Kaito. Jeez. Um, yeah, I think there was even some point where Tamio was like, she was backing up and then she's right next to Nashi and she is, starts to read some sort of scroll or do something. And that's when yeah. the Wandering Emperor's like, yo, I got to kill this bitch because she's going to hurt Nashi. a child. Yeah which yeah. is what she does. And she does read a scroll because immediately after that, as the dust settles, we get Tamio's unending story. So this is this spirit Kami thing. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's, I think it's a Kami. Um, it would kind of make right. sense where, with her, where she's from, uh, but it is released from that scroll that she was reading right before she died. And it is her like safety plan so the it's basically it, tamio it looks like tamio except for it's she's made up of letters and characters mm -hmm. of whatever language um right one pictures. of her ancient scrolls mm -hmm. and that's like her and she speaks as if she's she doesn't speak as if she's tamio but she speaks as if like uh basically saying like i was tamio wrote me just in case something like this happened right and um, in the event of her death, I would be unleashed and then I would be able to continue to tell the stories that she's had forever so that they don't die. She's the unending story of Tamio uh, to keep up the storytelling, um, which is cool and also such a fucking smart plan and such a Tamio thing to do. So it yeah. fits. It surprised her. me. Though. Yeah. I mean, it surprised me because I wasn't, I didn't think Tamio well, was going to get straight up slashed and like died, but yeah. having having something else that like represents Tamio after she's gone is very magic. So expect a card or something. There were a few hints of Tamio's like humanity or soul still being with her mm -hmm. at some point. And so I thought that that was going to like play out in a different, slightly different way. But this I think is the way that makes the most sense that mm -hmm. is in keeping with Phyrexians kind of being, yeah. totally gone totally it's gone. like yeah she, it, there actually wasn't any part of her left but she had literally encapsulated it in the scroll that was with mm -hmm. her and so that was the part of tamio that was still there yeah so the only thing that would feel like she was still teensy bit inside is that she read that scroll right before she died right um and she had the wherewithal to like remember oh yeah i have a death plan and i'm about to die because this mm -hmm. this lady is way better than me so yeah um so tamio's unending story uh gives nashi a big hug and kind of kisses him on the cheek i'm sure and then um that's it one phyrexian planeswalker down and a bunch to go got him. but uh and then the uh the story from earlier uh just kind of finishes um with the Phyrexian invasion is the last part of like that story that Tamio was talking about at the, the top of the chapter. Um, and then uh, we once again see that it's being fought against the uh, by the protector in white. So the protector in white is this person that we've been seeing at the end of each chapter. So I'm sure that will be important at some point. We'll we'll find out who that is and what that is. Probably so, not. Probably not. It's probably just a thing. Um, but, uh, overall this chapter, uh, like some weird stuff happened, but I did like the end of it. I liked that we killed somebody body count. I'm a big fan of body count. Always <laughs> good. 
Um, it is sad to see Tamio gone. I did like her. She's the first planeswalker that got Phyrexianized. And um, so it's... It so is... I was really worried because of the hints of Tamio still being in there that like... Mm-hmm. At first, I was like, "Is the Nashi? Is the stupid Nashi thing going to work?" I would mm-hmm. hate that. Yeah, that better not be what happens. But then I was like, "Oh, there's going to be some sort of appeal, and she's going to like convert back." Was my fear mm-hmm. that it was like they were going to take the cop out route and like Tamio gets converted back because some part of her was always there. So I was really happy with this. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a great like. I don't even want to call it a compromise. It was like true to she was definitely just a Phyrexian. Mm -hmm. But before any of that happened, she had created a backup plan. Yeah. And I was like, I like that. That's a good way to have done it. Mm -hmm. And I wonder how many other Planeswalkers have created backup plans. Because it's it's such a Planeswalker thing to do. For um, sure. That I wouldn't be surprised if we see more of this. But I really like this one. I think I'm, I'm happy with how it turned out. So mm-hmm. same. And I thought it was cool the way they were weaving in the like story of Karn and Mirrodin and mm-hmm. Memnarch. Uh, yeah. Throughout because Tamio is a storyteller. Yeah. And so it, that fits well. It was just nice. So yeah. everything was great except for the Dashi stuff. Yeah. Uh, Kaito really shouldn't have let him try that. No, but it also reckless just... Kaito. I, I think, but you know what I'm going to take, I, I think I'm going to take a different opinion on this now, as we've just talked about it. I'm going to decide that it's actually more of a reflection of Kaito's character, that he just makes bad choices. And he, we might see him make better choices in the future because he's learning from past events. And that like, I hope so. that it's less of a, oh, the story needs to do this. So let's just make it happen. And more like Kaito should not be able to just say yes to shit that, that he shouldn't. Like, but the other thing I was thinking is like when they're both, you know, Kaito and Kai are like, all right, we need to kill Tamiya. Who's going to do it? Me or you? Kaito's like, I'll do it. I was sitting there thinking like, really? Like, yeah. wasn't it the last storyline where you were having trouble with a basic Phyrexian and like Kaya came in and whooped its ass for you? Yeah. So shouldn't we really send Kaya here though? Like, mm-hmm. aren't you just going to get your ass kicked? <laughs> yeah. And I think that's a character flaw and like he yeah. has. But also, like, why does maybe... it... If I were Kaya, I'd be like, no, you can't do it. (laughs) You suck. Kaya should do the same shit and go out. They should just go together. Why were they separated? Why not both of you fight? Team up. That's the whole March of the Machine. We already saw team up cards. Team up already. Come on. There was something about like Kaya saying, now we're even after the Wandering Emperor saved Kaito. And I was Mm -hmm. like, did Kaya go get her somehow? Like, I I don't know. how, How are you even? He saved you. And then, and then the Wandering wanders. Emperor saved him. <laughs> Doesn't make you two even. Whatever. Anyway, let, let's keep this train rolling because yeah, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna talk about that forever. But uh, anyway, this is episode number four, Beneath Eyes Unblinking. Fucking creepy as shit. Um, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> we are jumping right in with Tyvar, who is on call. Hey, Tyvar! Yeah, Tyvar. So basically, it seems like Elish Norn told everyone to go to their home plane, and then everyone on Dominaria also decided to do the same. They were like, you know, we should all go to our home plane. That's pretty smart. Um, they're all getting invaded right now. So Tyvar comes back to Skemfar, which Kaya, is... I guess. Yeah, she did. I actually don't know where she's from. Conspiracy plane, whatever that is. Um, someone going to guess Dominaria, because it's the odds I, I don't think it is. But anyway, so... Uh, Tyvar comes back to Skemfar, which is where he's from, on Kaldheim, the realm, and he immediately sees his brother Harald, or Harald, I don't know how to say it. Um, I've always been saying Harald, but... I think Harald probably It's based on pretty much nothing. Yeah. Anyway, let's go with that. So Harald is fighting some Phyrexians. Eh, look at that. I, everybody's fighting Phyrexians because they're invading everywhere, so that makes sense. And immediately, um, Tyvar just jumps down, turns his arm into like a metal spear, and just like stabs one. And so yeah. uh, that's pretty sick. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> and then he's like, hello, brother. <laughs> and he's like, oh, you're here. Thank God. Uh, and then they, they do some brotherly banter as they're fighting Phyrexians. And uh, it's it's good. It's nice to see. It's nice to see Tyvar back. It's I do like seeing more of him, which is nice. Though uh, 
I think he's written a little bit better in this one than in past ones. This has a little yeah. bit more of like um, Thor and not Thor and Loki necessarily like the way they speak, but yeah, but but that type of relationship. Not that they're like at odds with each other, but um, just just the I guess kind of the, competing like yeah, they had a little bit of that like Legolas and Gimli vibe. Maybe maybe that's more of what it more. is. Who can kill more Phyrexians kind of thing. Yeah, I, I think it might be a little bit more of that. Um, but anyway, so they're they're fighting these Phyrexians, and then uh, there's like a this uh, bright light, and there's a doom scar that hits, uh, which a doom scar is when two realms knock into each other. Now, this is another reason why I think that like I was pretty certain that doom scars were very uncommon. Mm -hmm. um however they keep happening every time we come to call time like immediately so yeah I, you only tell us a call time story if a doom scar happens yeah i guess that's true so anyway this doom scar comes in and uh it just like they fall into like a rocky watery place because i think this other realm smashes into them and water goes everywhere and there's a bunch of omen speakers in these like boats that are trying mm -hmm. to save them. I was a little confused by some of this. It is confusing when you jump to a new plane and then that realm on that plane gets invaded by another realm on right. that plane. And I don't know which one yeah. it is. And it just, so I don't exactly know what happens, but I know they're in water and I know they're getting out of water into these long boats, the Omen Speakers. Yeah, based, so the Omen Speakers are the ones that can like travel between the realms and they mm -hmm. take their shit, their long boats. Oh, to right. Do that. So they could be anywhere. So right, during right, a right. doom scar, I think they're like the lifeguards kind of thing. <laughs> nice. It's their duty to go pick everyone up. Um, <laughs> and when like first <laughs> the white on their nose and they're throwing the, the thing. <laughs> oh, I'm picturing like Baywatch style. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> red bathing suits. Yeah, so, yeah, that's so great. That's so, that's um, great. But originally, Tyvar summons like a huge slab of rock that's just holding everyone. Oh, he's just right. sitting there like holding everyone. He's like, dude, this is really heavy. I hope the Omen speakers get here soon. It's like, why are they running in slow-mo? Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> but then the Omen speakers come and they're like, guys, it's the end of the world. So this part I really liked because in Cal Time, they believe there's like an end of the world. And uh, everyone, it's like everyone that's how your glory is made go to go mm -hmm. to go to valhalla kind of thing so the omen speakers are there they have boatloads of like everyone on call time some fire giants some like you know zombies are even there mm -hmm. um and they're like will the elves fight and herald's like dude the elves will fucking lead this fight let's go and yeah. the elves all jump on the boats and i just that's basically like all we get from call time but i just really liked how they're like oh this is that end of the world thing that everyone's talking about it's time to die in a blaze of glory let's go fucking do it let's fucking do it yeah and then go up to starnheim yeah. yeah um they do after they jump in the boat they do look over and they see coma so coma yeah, is completed uh, yeah. yeah so coma is completed and coma is also the giant serpent that can just go through all the realms and then live around the world tree and like is in the um whatever the space in between the realms is. I don't remember what it's called. Um, yeah. Not the Blind Eternities, but a different thing. Yeah, anyway. The same thing, but it's a mini miniature version. Yeah, so the, the, Fire, version. the Phyrexians know who to fucking complete when they go to different places. And no kidding, Koma yeah. is 100% something you should complete. So Tyvar looks at him and he's like, I'm going to go to take care of this. And then he jumps off the boat and he's oh, like- Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah, that was yeah. so badass. And mm -hmm. as he's jumping, he's like, nobody's going to call me a coward. Mm -hmm. <laughs> He's like, um, because we'll there was a whole speech about you either go down in history as a hero or a coward. Mm -hmm. And he's like, well, I'm jumping into like a cyborg god snake's open mouth right now. Yeah. So let's, I gotta call let's me a coward. Him. Pretty fucking <laughs> sick. I'm excited to see what happens with that in the future. But we yeah. are cutting straight. Tyvar is one of my new favorite planeswalkers after his new Yeah, cards, so. That's true. That's true. Um, we are cutting straight over to Kaladesh with a new person we haven't talked about in a really long time, uh, Paya Nalar. Yeah, I had to like read this one again. I was like, wait a minute, sorry, who? Is this Chandra's mm -hmm. mom? Is that who we're talking about right now? Yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly right. We're talking about Chandra's <laughs> mom. I mean, um, I used to love this card as well, but that was like, what, five years ago at least? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so 
Anyway, she is starting to see the unblinking eye everywhere, which I'm pretty sure is like the, the cross with the circle, which is the fire scene symbol. That's the mm. unblinking eye. So it's like right. it's in her tea. It's on the ground. It's on the wall. It's in the shadow. She sees it everywhere. And it's like this weird premonition that something bad is going to happen. So she tells Sahili, uh, who they then go to the council or the consul. I don't know. I think it's consul, actually. Sorry. Um, consul, yeah about this impending doom because she's expecting like this is going to be something horrible i don't know exactly what it is but something bad is going to happen um and they listen to her it's it's phenomenal they're like oh shit yeah okay we yeah it's basically her. like pia or paya and mm -hmm. sahili have just been like not crazy have been like mm -hmm. honest and uh like shown themselves to be quite shrewd over years and years and years so when for the first time ever they come in with a theory that sounds kind of crazy people were inclined to just take their word for it because they've mm -hmm. been right an awful lot yeah and this is another one of those times so yeah. the uh consul does realize that there will be an invasion and so they make an army um, with uh, as many of their types of ships as they can. And then Sahili finishes working on this thing she calls Operation Golden Scales, which uh, we will find out to be a bunch of like gold and bronze, like lizard robots. Yeah. Um, that she, and, and there's like a bunch of different types of weird robots that are like her Golden Scales robots. Um, yeah, I was wondering during this part, like, I don't think Sahili went to Ixalan, right? Was she going to Ixalan? Is that something that was going to happen before? I don't, I was just wondering if like she saw dinosaurs and came back and was like, oh, I'm going to make all these huge ass reptile robots. So she, so what happened was Huatli went from Ixalan to Kaladesh and met Sahili there. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so that's what happened. I was like, I don't think Sahili was on Ixalan. How did she like get inspired by dinosaurs? Yeah, it, and that's actually a good call. I didn't pick that up, but that is a good idea. That, that's probably exactly what it is because Huatli plane shift or plane shifted planes walked right after the end of Ixalan when the immortal sun was gone mm -hmm. and she met up with uh, Sahili immediately that's the first person she saw gotcha uh, and, yeah okay and and just uh, she Sahili's a poet uh, sorry Huatli's a poet so she r read her poems about dinosaurs to her and then that must have been her inspiration for these um mm -hmm. Nice. I didn't pick, I was just thinking, oh yeah, okay, cool. It's like hex gold, but not, um, that makes a lot more sense is the, the dinosaur thing. Um, nice. <laughs> I like that. Uh, anyway, uh, they have this army and all these like robots and stuff, and then everything fucking explodes and goes to shit because of course it does. Um, that's when the fire scenes invade, but this is probably the only plane that was prepared. For the invasion all the other ones i'm sure weren't for sure yeah exactly um, um now how you know how much their preparations helped is yet to be determined you know there's mm -hmm. stories of these golden dinosaurs getting converted and fighting for the other team now and it's like ooh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is true it is true <laughs> less than ideal yeah yeah probably yeah um which i didn't totally get because they're not like living at all i kind of thought phyrexians converted living things um, well i thought the kaladesh machines would be alive per se but i guess they've converted like weather light and stuff yeah they can do anything but like metal easier i think than than flesh it's flesh. even easier to convert robots I would think, yeah i think so yeah it makes sense um so anyways the fire extends so are def defending with a whole bunch of robots doesn't seem like the best idea <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah probably not um so anyway the fire extends are invading and uh they have all figured out that they are trying to go and destroy uh the um, aether flux reservoir either destroy it or take its aether or or something and that thing does 50 damage you gotta you yeah. gotta take it out exactly so um pretty worried about this and so that becomes a race and so the thing what we're trying to do is we're trying to get sahili and pia or paya to get to aether flux reservoir as fast as possible 
uh, and they get in a car. I love it. That's just straight up. They get in the car, <laughs> like I'm Kaladesh. <laughs> awesome. Um, so they're basically in this like race car, uh, speeding down um, to go get there. Um, I think they stop and they they see like a guard that has a who's been completed, but there's a hole in his face um, yeah. where a javelin had gone through and stabbed him out, but he's like still walking and moving because he has now been turned. Um, yeah, it's a particularly nice scene because I was like, oh. Yeah, it's like, that's, that's really <laughs> Pia fun describes how she could see like right through his face and see yeah. the other side of it, but he's still like breathing. His, yeah. his chest is rising and falling. In a weird way. Um, Ugh. Anyway, uh, as they're doing that, there's like a helicopter or something that comes down, and it turns out to be Pia's friend, Baji, who uh, who finds her and he offers her a ride so they can get to Aetherflux faster. Um, yeah, clearly some like, so, you know, tiny bit of backstory, like Pia led a revolution, essentially, back in the day, and Baji... Yes. It's part of that revolution. Yeah, they're That's like how they're renegades. Um, renegades, yeah, they're yeah. renegades together. Um, so he has this. Yeah, I don't know how to. I was thinking of it more as like a Star Wars kind of crap. You know, like the junk piles that fly around in Star Wars. Oh, okay. Like um, but it's essentially what it is because it's a bunch of junk. It's just. A... <laughs> this guy managed to cobble together. together yeah <laughs> so it's yeah. a little it's a little shoddy and we know that because he can only let one person on yeah the and, almost... and it has uh, just a touch of highly illegal weaponry so yes it's like and... this flying piece of crap but then it has these like crazy <laughs> guns <laughs> that are so illegal that they're outlawed yeah <laughs> Uh, so the idea is that Sahili will drive the car on the ground and the helicopter will shoot. Uh, I guess I think it's a helicopter. Uh, that was just in yeah, my it mind. Could, it could be. Well, yeah, whatever. Sure. The, 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 the aircraft is shooting. Well, all we uh, know down. is it's clearly a piece of shit. Yeah. <laughs> like imagine when when um, Pia, I guess, is it Pia? I, I'll, I'll just say Pia from now on, I guess. Um, yeah, I've always said Pia, so... You're not, I always said, change, you're not gonna change it for me but well i feel like it's just say paya and i'll say pia <laughs> that just seems like so confusing but yeah. sure whatever i'll say i'll say paya then um <laughs> so paya gets in it and then like you can yeah, i can imagine that she sees the bolts like shaking out of it as they're moving right. <laughs> like oh this is not so great um I mean, it's like imagine a friend told you they built a car out of like stuff they found. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not kidding in that. Are you crazy? <laughs> you fucking nuts. Yeah, if Jeff told me he built a car, actually, no, yeah. to be fair, if Jeff told me, I would probably believe him and that would be to my demise, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd be like, this thing could go 200 miles an hour. What? <laughs> and then I might not get in because that would scare me. But um, yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so we're up in this aircraft thing, and it uh, seems, you know, we're worried about it. Um, and Sahili's racing on the ground, but I don't, it doesn't seem like a great plan because there's so much shit in the way. Like, this is the reason again, It's one of those plans that doesn't make a ton of sense, but it was made, at least this one was made in seconds. Yeah. Right? It's like the flying machine comes down, they're like, hey, do you want to get in here? And it's like, like, I don't know, should I? I guess so. Yes, yeah. <laughs> jumps in. And um, as they're up there, they're kind of like uh, chit-chatting back and forth, uh, Baji and yeah. um, Super Pia. calm, given the situation. Yeah, no, he's like, oh, this is fucking sick. I haven't seen you in a long time. Yeah, this is awesome. So he's long. Like, looking back at her, and then <laughs> yeah. mid-sentence, a fucking javelin goes through the windshield and pierces through his body, and he's pinned yeah. to the cockpit, and he's <laughs> out, dead. Like, and she's like behind him, and it pierces through the chair and like mm -hmm. right in front of her face essentially yeah. but doesn't get her and it's one of those like oh shit like it's one of those moments where like it's just too <laughs> calm and happy and you know yeah. something's going on and as you're reading you see like someone with a dialogue with like three dots after it you're like yeah, oh yeah, fuck yeah. <laughs> yeah i know it's gonna happen it's like a movie scene i've seen a bunch of times yeah. before but always love it it's yeah just like yeah. so it's, it's still like hey we should catch up so <laughs> yeah and so what happens is they're in the air and this giant javelin comes through kills him 
she gets up to go try to grab the controls and like lift the the aircraft thing up because it's like you know shooting straight down towards the ground um yes, yes, however right. while she sees that um she realizes that the, the javelin is not in fact a javelin it's a quill so is this one of tamio's random quills that shot off in kamigawa and went into Kaladir somehow because of how close it got with the realm breaker because it specifically said quill it did and it seemed crazy that a quill would be that large to go through his body so that that was a something i thought of when we were talking about the quills earlier so i want to yeah I, I don't know, because we aren't 100% that she was throwing quills, but if she was. <laughs> okay, but I think, so I think a quill is also like um, an animal spike, you know, like a porcupine Shh. has quills. So it came from Ikoria. <laughs> yeah, well, I think, it, I think this is like a metal animal and a okay. quill is just like something they launch okay so is so, how i was interpreting that so it's I, more... they were using the word quill too often and yeah i was getting confused so so you're saying that it's probably one of sahili's like golden robot things it's probably one of her like dinosaurs yeah okay uh because they're like pterodactyl uh things gotcha because that makes more sense i was getting more excited with the possibility that the planes were getting close enough that things could shoot through the planes. That's an interesting idea. I re now and I like, wish that is what had happened. Like, so. like Sahili's quill was thrown and because it went through the blind eternities, it got bigger somehow and went into Kaladesh and then, <laughs> yeah. And like on a yeah. scale, Kamigawa is larger than Kaladesh for some reason. Anyway. Um, I mean, it could be, you know, I don't know like, who, who knows who, who could ever know. Yeah. Anyway, um, and we're gonna we're we're plummeting to the earth. Uh, all of that aside, sorry, we got a little off track. I just got excited because I thought that was cool. Um, I still the... like the idea that it's literally a giant like feather. I mean, <laughs> that's what I thought when I read it. But Pretty badass. Yeah. Anyway, this aircraft is uh, hurtling towards the earth, and Paya is trying to pull it back up and like uh, not die. <laughs> And uh, oh, one thing they they mentioned, which I really liked this touch, yeah, is that because uh, what's his name, Baji, mm -hmm. like cobbled this aircraft together. None of the controls make any fucking sense. It's just oh, like right. whatever he made. <laughs> yeah. So he's like the she only doesn't... person who understands it she has a giant feather poking out of his chest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she's like not only trying to pull this thing out of free fall. The controls make no fucking sense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, but as that's happening, all she can think about is how uh, Chandra is coming over next month to drink tea with her, which is something they do. She's going to fucking so, be there. Yeah. Um, and she's going to make sure that she is there. Absolutely. Um, so Tyavar jumps into coma. Paya is hurtling towards the earth. And of course, we cut right to Atraxa, who is on New Capena. Uh, and this is our third little chunk of this chapter. Uh, all right. This one, as we quickly get through this, because it is one of the weirder ones, but actually it's it weird. Yeah. May, uh, may matter a lot in the future. But, I think it will, yeah. Yeah, so Atraxa is, and this is why we say weird. Atraxa is dealing with her feelings about the word beautiful and how important it seems to have become in her life. Now, Elish Norn uses the word beautiful often to describe the way Elish Norn looks and how everyone else looks that Elish Norn has made. Everyone is porcelain and beautiful and completed and nice and perfect. And Atraxa is not feeling like be so-called beautiful things are giving her rage, basically. Yeah. Um, and basically in their invasion, wherever she is at the moment, they're converting a lot of maestros, I believe mm -hmm. it was. And the maestros who are newly converted have this notion of what's beautiful, like their museums and their art and stuff. And so she's hearing an ever growing like throng of these mm -hmm. maestros getting converted of what they think beauty is. And so she's like going through the museum 
And she's like, is this beautiful? And the maestros are like, yes, that's beautiful. And that pisses, that pisses her off. Mm -hmm. Because she doesn't think so. And a lot of those pieces are actually old Phyrexian artifacts from when the invasion happened back in their time. Right. And they believe that those old artifacts are beautiful when she thinks they're obsolete and stupid. Um, right. And like offensive because mm -hmm. they... They have these conquered Phyrexians like on display for people to come right. and see or like laugh at. So mm -hmm. she's like, yo, this is unacceptable. She just, yeah. like, she just smashes everything. She destroys the entire museum, every piece yeah. in it that she hates. Like there was like a yeah. reference to Picasso in there because it was mm -hmm. about how their paintings were like getting worse. Like they weren't oh. even realistic anymore. And they were just like geometric, like depictions that vaguely yeah, yeah. resembled humans. It was like, ooh. <laughs> It's a harsh shot at harsh, Picasso. And yeah, uh, great though. I love it. Um, yeah. And then while that's happening, she also kills a bunch of the vampires. Um, because yeah, fuck and like them. anyone. And so the th I think the thing to call out about Atraxa on New Capenna that I don't know if we mentioned, but um, they're not. She her goal is not to convert people here, right? Um, because of the atrocities that New Capenna committed by building on top of the old Phyrexians was such an insult that uh, Elishnard was like, just fucking kill them all. And mm -hmm. then harvest, like whatever kind of scraps you can find that might be useful to that, like harvest it, take it back. Mm -hmm. But they're like, she's like harvest that plane. Um, right. So it has a bit of like uh, the kill the settlers kind of feel. Um, right. Which makes sense in the in the in the way that like if that was a phyrexia thing and there's something happened and then these people came or whatever um which we don't we don't exactly we don't know the full history of of this plane so it's really hard to know whether there was actually an invasion or whether it was actually right phyrexia but um this is part <clears> of like <throat> the humanity that kind of pokes through in the phyrexians where like you know, if you were just pure machine strategy, it's like, no, you convert as many people as possible, mm -hmm. build your army as big as possible. But they're just like, no, fuck these people. Like, they don't yeah. deserve, they don't deserve it. Just kill them. Yeah. And it's like, there's still a little bit of that, like, resentment and anger and, like, different feelings that mm -hmm. uh, they still have. Yeah. Um, I also think there is a bit that makes it feel like Atraxa doesn't, completely agree with everything Elish Norn says about what her beauty standards are. <clears throat> Even as she's destroying these pieces, uh, Atrax is trying to figure out exactly what that means to her. And, and, she, and she knows ex kind of what she's supposed to do with Atraxa, but also she might want to just do whatever she wants on this plane because Atrax, or uh, sorry, Atrax is doing whatever she wants and isn't listening to Elish Norn. Um, yeah, there was a, there were a few points where it away. felt like she was like intentionally loosely interpreting her um, directives. Yeah, it's like, oh, you said this, but like that can mean this to me or whatever. Right. Because um, yeah. then she comes out of the museum and then sees a bunch of like angel statues around it and then just beheads all of that, them. Just... That sets her off. Yeah. yeah. She's like, is and this then what they're getting think? like clouded in this halo dust essentially because mm -hmm. of these. That's what those angels were we're just straight up angels um yeah so she just kills all of them i and it it gave me like a fight club moment where mm -hmm. um you know he beats up on um what's his face the well actually holy shit no it's in the movie fight club that character's name's angel <laughs> where he said he wanted to destroy something beautiful that's why he just beat that guy's face into the into a pulp. That, literally this scene might be inspired by that that's crazy um yeah his name's angel right i'm pretty sure it's angel. yeah it's a little too um, coincidental i think mm, the author might be a fight club fan uh, yeah uh, very cool um and uh anyway as this is happening uh there's a group of seraphs and uh a person called the visitor who look on and they're waiting for the beginning of the end. The, more of the beginning of the end. Um, just these people seem to be on every plane watching everything happen, waiting for something before they do something. So uh, we'll have to figure out who that is, I guess. Yeah. 
my interpretation here of this was that like Elshnorn intentionally sent a Traxa because she might be immune or better resistant to the traps that, or whatever the defenses that the angels have. Mm -hmm. And this made it seem like actually it was the exact opposite was true. She was more susceptible to like, yeah, get enraged by this and just go blast all the angel statues and sk sk like spread halo dust fucking everywhere. And like, there's a point where her army is like radioing into her like, hey, this this dust is brutal. We're weary. And she's, she's just like, oh, Phyrexians don't get weary. Keep going. And so, well, Shnorn might have made a mistake. Wow. Or did she want her to do this? Who Maybe. knows? Maybe also, she's like, damn, Atrax is like a 7-7 seven, seven flying bit. Like, I can't beat that shit. Yeah, yeah. Let's get just send her some, uh, someone else to take care of her. Yeah. <laughs> but like... I mean, when you have an Elishnorn and uh, a Traxa together, well, when they're opposite, a Traxa does nothing. But when they're together, they well, a Traxa does seven, twice seven as much. Flying vigilance, death touch, life. That's life. true. That's true. But the reason the reason you play <laughs> the card is not yeah. that isn't the reason you play the card. Um, but how much do you really need to double a Traxa trigger? Like, <laughs> like deck yourself. Yeah. <laughs> You don't have to pick all of them. Um, you do. But, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that is the end of chapter four. We have gotten through most of this, and we need to get to a beer break uh, to grab our next yeah. beer because mine's been empty for uh, quite a long time, which means yeah, we've been, been saving for a long it. Time. The last all right, so, here. so Jeff, let's go to a beer break and uh, finish this up. Cheers. All righty, Jeff. This is one of your favorites, so I think you should probably introduce this one. All right. This is a classic. This is Labatt Blue. Um, if you, yeah, if you grew up in Canada, you probably had this one before, maybe in high school. Uh, but yeah, this one's been around a long time. Sort of like a, just one of the big macro brews we have here um last time i gave it silver one you gave it silver three so this one is sort of brought in by my rating mm -hmm. so thanks a lot jeff making me mm -hmm. drink this swill again um <laughs> no 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 um also we had a little confusion uh we forgot and we'll just remind you because you probably forgot as well that Labatt, the, the brewery, has been around since 1847, but Labatt Blue came around in 1951 um, because the label yeah. was blue and they support the Blue Bombers, which is Winnipeg's CFL team. God. And so people started. See, I didn't it. know that about it. I might not have rated it Silver One if I'd known that it was <laughs> supporting the CFL. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I thought you liked the Hamilton Tiger Cats now. Uh, no, that's false. <laughs> they should... they look exactly like the Steelers if you look at their like, um, oh. <laughs> lo like color scheme and their jerseys and stuff. So, mm. um, no, so a little hard to find that. All right. Well, when the Argonauts play them, maybe I should drive down and we'll go to a game and and <laughs> yeah, the we'll go to the Argonauts Tie Cats game. Yeah, it, buy, they're probably buy a bunch of Labatt Blue to support the Blue Bombers. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> It would be a lot cheaper, I'm sure, than going to an NFL game. Yeah, but rightfully so. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know any of the players. Should we start a CFL fantasy league? <laughs> oh, God. That exists. <laughs> I'm sure it does. Yeah. We'd probably have to do all the, the stuff ourselves, though. But anyway. It's like a spreadsheet. Yeah, <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, Jeff, we've come a long way tonight, but we are finally in episode number five with it with... <laughs> which is oh, cathartic reunion. So uh, we are now with Chandra on New Phyrexia, and she's also with Ren. So this is from Chandra's perspective the whole time. But, you know, we're back with her, which is fine. You know, only two out of five is Chandra. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So is this confirmed that 
cathartic reunions getting reprinted in the set with the Chandra and Nissa art or I'm sure I'm sure it is <laughs> I'm just this is all the confirmation I needed for that this yeah. chapter being called that so spoiler I guess we're gonna see Nissa <laughs> in this episode um <laughs> Anyway, so we land on New Phyrexia and immediately find Koth and Valera, who mention that they recently took down the scrambler that like stopped planeswalkers from being able to planeswalk into the specific part of New Phyrexia that they wanted to. And they're like, wow, uh, we didn't expect people to arrive so soon. So I'm, I'm assuming that they like destroyed it and then immediately they showed up. Right. Um, which must have been a coincidence because Chandra... Yeah doesn't have a plan <laughs> for sure i think this author is like actually fairly decent at um identifying things that astute readers might call out and trying mm -hmm. to at least um flashlight it yeah exactly at least mention it so you know it's not some crazy oversight it's just mm -hmm. i only have so many words to work with so just want to say that i do appreciate that um to uh, K to help Arsenault. Us. Yeah. Um, I understand that you're like, oh, people are going to say, wasn't there a planeswalker blocking thing on this plane? How did they just planeswalk in? But I acknowledge that it's not worth it for me to write about how that got taken down at light. Like, it's not worth the few words I have to commit to that. So yeah. I'm going to try to make like a joke out of it that like they destroyed this thing and then Chandra yeah. was there. Yeah. <laughs> Which, you know, totally makes sense. Uh, you basically have that, or you get to talk about how um, somebody points out that that thing happened, or like yeah, Chandra right. says it, and then they have to explain it. So mm -hmm. totally works. It's it's totally fine, but it is kind of funny. Um, anyway, Koth looks at them and is <laughs> not a super pleased with who arrived. He's like, wait. <laughs> We we took down that that scrambler thing, and you're the only two to that's show. What we, that's what we get. Fire uh, hair in the fucking tree. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> and Malira <laughs> is like trying to calm him down a little yeah. bit. Like, hey, you know, any help is good help. Mm -hmm. huh? Like, <laughs> yeah, be nice to your new friends. Um... <laughs> but you, like from his perspective, he's been fighting this wildly uphill battle for so long. It's yeah. Just like, I have two more people to help good. Now I'm only yeah. outmatched like by the same percentage I was before because this yeah. is a trivial so, thing. Yeah. But but we are planeswalkers as they stand with their hands on their hips. We're <laughs> planeswalkers. So we're better like, than yeah, I just had like eight planeswalkers come try to help. And, yeah, they uh, fucking <laughs> left and then told you not to come so they all actually changed teams um so that yeah. was kind of a bummer that actually was worse <laughs> actually, our opponents are much stronger now <laughs> um but anyway ren does talk about the plan that they have which is to fuse with the realm breaker and they all just decide that that's a probably good plan and we'll just uh, stick with that one um yeah this is yet another instance of i don't know if that plan is good but we had no plan. And yeah. so maybe I we think go with that. this plan seems better than the Nashi plan. So I'm fine. Um, I, well, let's let's wait till we get to the next stage of this plan. All that's, right. That's true. That's where it really falls apart for me. <laughs> that I do agree with this part. So um, <laughs> the, before we get to the next stage of the plan, uh, Chandra also mentions that Teferi is going to come at some point to Koth, and Koth yeah. just looks at her and he's like, Hilarious. Who the fuck is Teferi? Koth, Koth is like, It's just you two. And they're like, Well, Teferi might be coming as well. And Koth's like, Who the fuck is that? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe a third guy might be coming. Great. Cool. And they're like, No, he's really, really good. He, he does like time <laughs> stuff. He's like, I don't have time for that. This is yeah. dumb. Um, <laughs> which i loved that was great i mean like you guys are... like she just she tries to name drop and it just doesn't work yeah <laughs> it, it is nice because koth makes me I, I identify with koth a lot in this story oh yeah right for now, sure where it's like you shouldn't family. have come fuck you guys this is stupid bring more people like actually help <laughs> why are you coming with just two people <laughs> have a real plan like, come on. Like, you're just gonna... What the fuck is this? What are you... Who am I working with? A bunch of fucking amateurs here? What is this? 
That's what and it feels none like. of the people that I just like trusted last time came back, so they're obviously mm -hmm. leaving me to die. Yeah, like what the hell? <laughs> Where's that elf guy or like that ghost chick? Anyway, um, <laughs> we also finally get to go talk to Eurobrask, who apparently has been helping out everyone the whole time, but we just never see him. And we do now, and he's like kind of helpful i don't know he just seems like he says hey fuck elish norn that bitch yeah. is the worst and then just and then I, I would have liked a little more here basically he just tells us everything we already know which is like i've let you use my tunnels like it felt more like a reminder because that yeah. was in the last set of stories than anything yeah. like you might not have read that if you don't know Urbrask yeah. is helping the Mirans to mm -hmm. fight back in their rebellion against Elishnorn. He gives a little bit of a reason why, but the reason is I don't agree with Elishnorn, which is yeah. like, obviously that was the reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Literally, yeah, I, there is no situation where that's not the reason. <laughs> yeah, it, it also seems like he may have been the one who like convinced Shieldred to come to his side, but I don't really understand. He He, he just, he kind of insults them and like just doesn't he, he's an ally yeah. that we don't really like but he's like there and he know, speaks weird. in that like phyrexian thing i was talking about where they don't really mm -hmm. have any they don't show any emotion really at all with the one exception of him being like elish norn's a dummy and i don't agree with her yeah. but the rest of it's very much like i have secured the passageway her guards do not view this passageway it is used mostly for maintenance even this even despite this your chance of survival is very slim mm -hmm. <laughs> like it would have the only thing that would have made it exactly robot robotic like that of, is if he was like your chance of survival is 0. 0.0018 yeah, yeah. percent mm -hmm. like, and you're like okay but, <laughs> i get it or her, her i get it like her brass dude i did not need to know the exact number holy yeah. shit <laughs> um anyway so this next part is what Jeff is talking about earlier. I'm pretty sure where mm -hmm. um, it's they can see the realm breaker basically, but it's over this giant like there's a big I don't know a, there's a great there's a great uh, Grand Canyon in between them and the yeah. realm breaker, and they're like all right well first what we have to do is we're gonna have some people go over here and uh, fight so that it distracts everyone. And then, Koth, I'm Koth, then Nissa, I'm going to throw you, I'm going to fling you over the chasm with my lava rocks, and you'll land over there. Yeah. And that's the There's like, I'm imagining like a bridge, right? And the bridge is the obvious way to go, but that's super defended. So they send a whole bunch of people to die at the bridge mm -hmm. and hopefully distract, and then just try to throw them across like in my head it's not even that far over it's like it's like just a, just like a hundred yards over or something we're gonna yeah. throw you across this part <laughs> where there's no bridge uh but that's where the maintenance that's where it's only used for maintenance so yeah it's that's the whole plan that's the whole plan we're gonna send a whole bunch of people to die and hopefully it takes elish norn long enough to kill them that you guys can enact your plan while we throw you across over here yeah um it also seems like the other stories that took forever to find realm breaker and where it was and how deep and whatever i guess yeah. no i guess we're not the base of it it's just everywhere and Koth was like a part of that mission so like yeah. he knows i guess i was thinking like why didn't we have to go down into the depths but realm breaker has broken through all of the, the yeah they, they mentioned that like when they got there it didn't look anything like what the what three planes office told them it looked like because yeah it's much bigger now um anyway so they get flung over and it's basically like uh chandra's like on a uh, rock skateboard and there's fire underneath it shooting her across uh, yeah i pictured it as red. like they all stand on these rocks and then cough like punches the ground and that jets the rocks jets, off shoots him over it's basically something like that and while they're in the air there's a bunch of like phyrexian little like bugs fighting them yeah, or something bats. or bats yeah bats um and they have like... the bats were also shooting quills this was part of what made me be like oh, okay this is some sort of like 
thing. These Phyrexian animals have shoot porcupine quills. quills All right. Kind of I thing. still like my idea, but sure, <laughs> that's fine. Um, <laughs> all these all these bats are very well educated and they have quills in their writing. Yeah. They throw the quills. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> but uh, basically they are they're like bats, but they're also like scissors, but they're also like metal and they just like are trying to chop them up. And as it's happening, Chandra does a classic uh, blast him move. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Ren is like also flying in the air over by her side and has grabbed one of the bats and is beating the other bats with the bats. So mm -hmm. which um, I appreciated that. Yeah, like a true baller. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's that's great. And then we kind of land on the other side. Uh, Chandra like cracks her rib, um, but uh, mm -hmm. we do get there. And uh, she's as she's laying on the ground, looking at her rib and being like, "Oh fuck, okay, this kind of sucks." But like, we're getting through it. Yeah. She looks over and she sees that Ren is fighting some mage, and the mage is shooting like green magic at her. And as Ren's trying to, or it, I don't know, them, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, them, that's probably right. Um, uh, so Ren is like fighting off this green mage, and it turns out that that green mage is. Nessa. <gasps> Jeff spoiled it earlier, but. <laughs> It's Nissa. Sorry, I, I, for, I didn't even realize that this was supposed to be a spoiler because it was mm -hmm. just so obvious that Chandra is going to meet Nissa in. Uh... In New Phyrexia. I know, but we didn't know if it was going to happen right away. Come on. <laughs> anyway. I mean, I think the like art for this story is literally Chandra and Nissa staring at each other. <laughs> so yeah, like... well, I, but the but our listeners don't know that. Oh, I <laughs> assumed trying... that you were going to edit the art in for each chapter. Um, oh, in the video. Oh yeah, you want yeah yeah you want me to edit all the art? I thought you were going to do. Do you not oh, do yeah. that? No. Do you watch no. our videos? Do you want, <laughs> do you listen to our podcast? <laughs> <laughs> of course um, of course yeah. um <laughs> also by the way i was wondering the same thing and they mentioned when they talk about ren they do say her or okay. she but when it's like both of them together they say they so i gotcha. think like seven is not gendered and then ren is female gotcha that makes and sense then obviously together they're pair, pair that's that's probably why i was thinking that in the first place um but uh, anyway, so holy shit, it's Nyssa. Uh, this is great because Chandra really basically came here for this. Chandra said that she was coming here to do all the Realm Breaker stuff and enact that plan. But we all really know that actually she came here for Nyssa and to see if she could en enact the Nashi plan, essentially to turn her back yeah i was gonna say this part must have pissed you off even more just yeah the, it's just the, the this build up on the, how many times is this not gonna work before you don't fucking try it yeah and then i think the thing that's most annoying of all is you know in like chapter nine so just just so people know we haven't read ahead i know by the time you're listening to this all of the stories are out but we've just read these five um because it's more fun to make like wild predictions and stuff like that mm -hmm. um but you know it's going to work in one of the later ones. They're going to try it like eight times, and then the ninth mm -hmm. time it'll work or something stupid. <laughs> it's like, come so on, like, you never should have tried that. <laughs> yeah. So, anyway, we'll get to that when we get to that. I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about even, so that's perfect. But, because um, <laughs> I, I haven't looked too much ahead. But <sighs> we get our Nissa Chandra face-off. Um and uh while this is happening uh chandra's also fighting off of some of these like i don't know fucking uh, uh they're the acolytes i think from uh elish norn and they throw some quills or javelins or something and nissa does like the pff, pff, stuck on the tree thing where like there's the yeah they go through her like very specifically go through her clothes only and don't actually hit her so she's just pinned to a tree um which i think the tree is just the realm breaker but yeah at least i yeah i assumed that as well i'm just gonna assume all projectiles are, are uh, quills at this yeah, point perfect um, which i'm imagining just as like giant spikes um, yeah with no further character than that oh man um, okay that's fine yeah <laughs> or we could just replace them all with quills like feathers because that's kind of fun i like that but anyway yeah. um so she, 
she gets pinned to the tree. And then she basically is watching Nissa like literally eviscerate Seven and like just leaving Ren there, but just like slashing Seven to the tree to pieces. Yeah. Um, and N- Chandra's sitting there like, oh man, I could totally help, but I don't want to hurt Nissa. And it's like, dude, Nissa, Nissa's fucking gone, okay? Mm-hmm. Nissa is clearly an evil Phyrexian lady. Who's destroying Just, your new friend. Yeah. Like, who literally had your, was the only one who had your back on this mission. Come on, Chandra. Yeah, she feels like the heat of the center of the sun in her body, but she knows yeah. that if she if she lets it go, it could destroy her friend. This is the same shit with the Silex earlier, where it's like, just blow up uh-huh. everything, and yeah. then you you figure out what's what's destroyed afterwards. But you have to do right. it now because if you don't do it now, you can't do it later. It's like, not going to do more damage than the Phyrexians are going to do. Yeah, like, come on, like is it going to? It's anyway. Though I guess to be fair, it is the argument of like, like the Silex and blowing up everything, maybe or only some stuff is the um what are the odds it blows up everything i i guess what i wonder how much they're trying to use like the should the u.s have dropped the bombs on japan or not argument which is like a a classic u.s history debate um and if that's that's a, a part of it a little bit but uh and I'm on the different side of that debate, so maybe I shouldn't be vying for the Silex. <laughs> so, yeah. so I don't know if the Japanese and the Phyrexians were exactly the same, but they're definitely not. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> there there might be something more interesting to to that argument, but that's for another time. I, I can't deal with that. We got to get through this. Um, so yeah, that's, <laughs> so, that's opening a whole can of worms. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, classic, classic me. Anyway, Chandra decides not to do anything to Nissa, and um, uh, Ren is gone. It's just seven. Um, yeah. And she's screaming and walking, trying to climb over to the Realm Breaker, but we know that that's just not going to work. Um, yeah. And uh, I also thought that, like, <laughs> Ren as just her dryad form just kind of sounds a little gross. Just, it's the same, <laughs> like, Shieldred thing. Where it's like you're missing something. It's just like a little. I don't know what it is, but it's kind of a strange. Yeah, and this made me wonder. Like when they're hanging out in the house or whatever, Mm -hmm. and Chandra's like teaching her fire. Is she on her tree, or is like the tree parked outside? You know what I mean? (laughs) (laughs) Seven's just like chilling. The best part when they were like just saying Ren and saying she and stuff, and then later it's like Ren and Seven do this. Oh, like, I didn't I think even... she had her tree parked outside. So she just like comes and goes whenever she wants. Yeah, I think she has legs and stuff. Like she's a legitimate just tree I think folk. she's a humanoid, but she oh. can like meld into a tree like a regular dryad. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Like a dryad arbor. Okay. Uh ish, but better. Huh. Interesting. Um I think I, that's the vibe I, I was getting from some of these just I was some a... of the weird things that were were dropped. I was like, "Come on, it can't be a big ass tree just like sitting in the living room playing cards or whatever." Like, or is this just the author doing what the author does and makes me confused about people's like? It's true. Movies. Yeah, it's I true. think Maybe that's a... that easily could be it, because I was under the impression that like Ren has only like needs to be around other things, and she jumps mm. from six to seven, and like doesn't doesn't just walk around by herself. Could be. I was thinking it's like more of a, a symbiotic relationship kind of thing. Like they're they're both their own people. Well, okay. one's a tree, but uh, interesting. They they combine together into into a greater than the sum of the parts kind of the kind of deal. All right. Well, we'll figure it out. But know. at this point, um, uh, Seven's gone, and Ren is uh, just on the ground, just laying there. Heard it. And it's worth noting that Seven was like rotting just from being there already. Right, because of the um the the toxins. Um mm-hmm. anyway, uh, Chandra ends up getting a javelin or sorry, a quill, 
A quill, uh, yeah. Because they call it a javelin, but it's not a... Yeah. Anyway, it's in her calf. And so that stabs yeah. her to the tree. So now she actually is hurt and she can't run away. And this is part of the time where she's like, okay, now I can't move. I can't run. I could burn up everything at this moment, but I won't because I don't want to hurt Nissa again. Right. It comes back to this. And um, and also, I'm sure that she also doesn't want to hurt uh, Ren, but still, like, mm. you came... That definitely feels secondary. This is why she, she came here for a mission, and her mission was to go, like, destroy Realm Breaker, but that's not really what her mission is. Her mission is to, mm -hmm. to save Nissa. And so that's why she's doing all of this. So her motivations yeah. are not what she tells us that they are. And I, I understand it. And that's what characters do. But it is annoying as hell. Um, yeah. So especially just... since like that whole scene of Chandra deciding to come out here was from Chandra's point of view. So yeah. like if they told it from another character's point of view, I'd be more on board with the she played it off like she has a plan to destroy realm breaker but really wants to go see nissa yeah and they didn't like they hinted at that maybe a little bit in chandra's feelings so it but... felt pretty obvious to me that the only reason she was coming was for that's what well, i just, thought i'm that's curious why, I the why it wasn't was explicit if it's from her point of view i guess like was the like, i don't were think they she... trying to convey that even she didn't know but it's like super obvious to the reader Right. Yeah, because, well, yeah, yeah, that's what I thought, because to her, 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 um, her point, the way that she convinces everybody else to go with her is to convince them that they have to cut the tree off at the roots, but she emotionally w wants to go because of Nyssa, but doesn't, like, that's the thing that controls her because she's so emotional, but she has to make up rational reason because she's always around people and has to do that all the time. And so that's what she came up with. Not that I don't think that it's like we were saying before. Yes, that's a good plan to go destroy the tree. You just need more people and like a, a real destroying the tree is a good thing, but you have to have. Yeah, yeah, you're plan. right that you have to destroy the tree. Mm -hmm. You can't just sit there and take wave yes. after wave of Phyrexian. But Nissa is the reason why she wants to go immediately, I think. Yeah, right. Yeah. As opposed to stopping to make a plan. So. Anyway, um, we do have the classic confrontation, and it's the very, very much like Nyssa is saying, join us, become a Phyrexian, we could use your powers, all that kind of stuff. It doesn't feel so Star Wars-y, but it does have that a little twinge of it. And it's like the same stuff as a Johnny with Elspeth or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um... It, it, it does have a little bit more of a flavor of like, your life is horrible. Like be with mm -hmm. us because everything will be better all the things that hurt you right now won't hurt you anymore we can be together which is the most important thing and and we can live forever and we'll all be together we'll be inside of each other in a weird <laughs> way but like yeah I hate that um i mean they wanted that anyway but like you know on their own terms not in the mm -hmm. whatever cyborg -y thing um so they <laughs> and Chandra's just like I'm not I'm not gonna do this and it's just it's just it's gotta end like it's gotta stop um as they're having this confrontation um Ren is like crawling over towards the realm breaker and reaching towards it to try to like like meld with it and that is when Nissa grabs her and um it, fucking it does something to her but she screams and it's kind of horrifying and scary um yeah it's all scary um and chandra's still pinned to the ground or pinned to the tree um so yeah things aren't looking great for our plan it's not going super well yeah we're in kind of do or die mode um and uh well we don't really have a plan and uh nissa just decides that you know what i, I guess what's going to happen is that you know it's 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 going to be me or them and and we're just going to go for it so she denies nissa's offer and um she 
moves out of uh this is way because this is coming to well you don't want to be with us then i'm gonna fucking cut you to pieces she takes one yeah. of the arm things and tries to slash her and chandra is able to duck out of the way and then oh boom yeah i think like a lot of the time it was Elish Norn talking through Nyssa, but then when Nyssa was like, hey, you should join us, like, the fighting can be over, people will stop ignoring you, and we'll take you seriously, and, like, all that. That was said through Nyssa's voice as a gotcha. way to try to... Really yeah, dig it in. Really, yeah, uh, twist it. And then Chandra's eventually, like, kind of thinks about it for a second, but then is like, no, I can't do that. And then, you know, Nyssa reveals that it was all bullshit, like, I'm just trying to get mm-hmm. you on my side and she goes like super evil face and tries to kill her I'm like mm-hmm. fuck you then like tries yeah. to kill her um and that's when chandra reacts with the uh heart of the sun because i had to check this a few times it definitely said heart mm-hmm. and i was like this is supposed to say heat of the sun right like am i crazy heart of the sun isn't crazy like it could mm-hmm. be what they meant to write but it's just it feels like it has to be heat of the sun <laughs> It was, it was something like nothing can withstand the heat of the, the heart of the sun. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, I think that makes sense because we know that Chandra has the heat of the sun and she is using her heart. I kind of like it a little bit. I don't know which one was actually intended. And I think most, like you could read it either way if you were just quickly reading and it would mm-hmm. make sense. Um I, it said heart so yeah. I, was, I had to check it a couple of times it was like because i was expecting it to say heat yeah so anyway chandra destroys nissa well we don't know this is the cliffhanger because the story ends right here right there where yeah. nissa or sorry chandra explodes and there's a flash of the heart of the sun the the mm-hmm. heat uh and things get burned away but we don't know what happens ran was is... like trying to pair with realm breaker and Nissa, mm-hmm. chandra was kind of like keep nissa busy as long as she could but yeah did she get make it in time who knows and that is the end of chapter five so we'll have to find out dun, what dun, happens dun. in the next five chapters but um yeah, Jeff, overall conclusions to the story. What'd you think? Um, we did some good ones throughout, but I just want to know overall, the first five, how are we feeling? Pretty good. Um, obviously, there's some stuff that's like, you know, the eternal curse of magic story is they're really short and they have to make like a ton of cards so, and they have so many characters that a lot of stuff basically a lot of stuff happens and they don't have a lot of words to describe all the stuff that happens. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it always feels rushed. Um, And so that's where you get a lot of these like dumb plans and, you know, just kind of little frustrating stuff like that. Um, But overall, I thought this one was pretty good. They did a good job of like uh, really making me, understand some different people's motivations in this grand conflict Mm -hmm. um, which is about all that i could really ask of what these five stories are trying to do yeah yeah i think i think about the same it was these were nice they didn't feel as well so this is funny you were saying that they don't have a lot of time these ones felt shorter than than that yeah type, these than ones usual. are even shorter than usual i think magic stories yeah. which it and might be... the first two were like all set up right so mm-hmm. you just you run out of words here yeah to get stuff done which to me felt nice because sometimes it gets bogged down by a bunch of little battles that don't matter mm-hmm. um and so i kind of liked the way that it was moving um but yeah normal magic story where things uh, plans just kind of develop out of nowhere and it's just like let's right they thing. just materialize and then they don't usually make a lot of sense but the author doesn't have a lot of time to like i don't want to i don't want more planning right definitely mm-hmm. don't want that so um 
yeah this and is it, like the compromise exactly it's more so that i like they choose flashy plans over good plans which is probably mm -hmm. the best choice so right if it were a novel, it'd be more like, okay, well, come on, why, <laughs> this plan is obviously ridiculous and mm -hmm. you had so much more time to develop a better plan. Yeah. But in something like this, it's like, no, just do something. And um, yeah, it, we just need the, it to keep moving. So yeah. um, that, I mean, we literally talked about what, like five different invasions in this, mm -hmm. in these five stories or four. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, uh, in these very uh, short stories, it is funny because of all the things like the little stuff is what I like the most. And it's literally mm -hmm. like Liliana rebuilding her manor. And that's like maybe a, a minute or sorry, a sentence. I'm thinking of movie yeah. terms, but like it's like a quick sentence of just like Liliana is more interested in that than Chandra. And I was like, that is I like all of that stuff. That's fun. Um, so every once in a while you get random nuggets of like, I mean, you also just don't know like what you're going to enjoy. So sometimes the things that have nothing to do with what we've been living in for the last couple of years in Magic Story um, are kind of just the fun one off whatevers. Um, similar to like how we, we we've liked some other random bits from stories in in the past where it's like, yeah, this this two sentence interaction was really nice uh, compared to yeah, the for rest sure. of the story. So. But yeah. And there were like there was like one good one per chapter, you know. There's like yeah. <laughs> even Elish Norn hates Luca, you know. There was the mm -hmm. Chandra re or Liliana rebuilding her mansion. Uh, later, there was like the cobbled together spaceship that has, of the course, it of has wacky things. controls because the yeah, guy yeah, built cause... it himself. <laughs> <laughs> so those kinds of things are great. I love to see them. Uh, and it's, Tons of fun. So um, I'm excited to read the rest of the story and tell all of you what's going on with that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so we have a part two coming up in a couple weeks. But before that happens, we do need to rate the beers and pick our winner for this evening. So Jeff, you ready to go to the last call? I am. Yes. All right. Let's finish it up. Cheers. Oh, Jeff, we've kind of, oh my God, I can't even speak anymore. We have come <laughs> a really long way. This is our fourth beer, which is hilarious. Our first episodes used to be three beers every night and we've switched yeah. to do less. So when we do Drunken Borthos, it's twice as many beers. Um, That's true. So That's just, good math. Yeah. I, hey, I have done math before. Yeah. Um, but our, our final beer of the night is Blue Moon. Blue Moon? I've never heard of that. What's yeah, that? this is a big deal because in Canada, this used to be called Belgian Moon. And the first mm -hmm. time we had this beer on the podcast, it was called Belgian Moon. But it's called Blue Moon everywhere else. So it makes me feel very nice to finally be able to say I can get Blue Moon in Canada and I don't look like a dummy when I order it at a bar. Someone, someone put in work to make this happen. Yeah. Whoever you are, I am so happy that you did this. It makes me just, please make beer the same name in all the different places that it is. It's so confusing yeah. when it's not. Um, I don't think we'll ever solve the uh, Budweiser check bar thing. But Yeah, uh, that's so confusing too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we understand that it's a Belgian white. That's great. Um, this is from the US and it is, what is it? 5.4%? Ooh, very nice. Belgian wheat beer. Um, the one thing with this beer is that it is vastly different style than the other beers we had tonight, which were Pilsners and lagers and pale lagers. So. Yeah, so this is the one, you know, we talked about Labatt Blue gets there because of my rating. Mm -hmm. This one is here because of your rating. Yeah. You ranked it silver one and I ranked it silver three. So. Mm -hmm. Which, um, like, obviously this one makes so much more sense to be silver one, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, and traditionally this was with, uh, accompanied with an orange, but we don't have one. 
which is fine because we don't drink with garnishes on the show. We don't rate with garnishes. We rate without them because, you know, well, it just makes Corona taste so much better. Because, yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway. It's interesting, right? If the beer is meant to be meant to be consumed with a lime, maybe yeah. we should. But story discussion for another time. It is. Um, we we might have to do a different series of which one is best with their accompanying fruit or whatever. But that is not tonight. Tonight we are rating these four beers we had: Heineken, Old Style Pilsner, Labatt Blue, and Blue Moon. Jeff, I got my silver four locked and loaded. I'm ready for this rating. All right, bring it in. I got him. All right, here we go. Four silver four. I'm going with old style Pilsner. This beer is not great. <laughs> um, it it definitely deserves its its plaque on cheap beer that looks cool but tastes. That's it. It's still beer, but silver four. Yeah. So I had my lineup here. The blue moon can is messing things up. I got to okay. adjust. All right. Um, first, the blue moon go over there. Um, but my my first can was uh, old style Pilsner. Yeah. Not... We, we took the first sip of this and I was like, this is so bad. Yeah, it's so bad. <laughs> Like Why I knew, is this in the second round? <laughs> I know, uh, and that was the thing. Like I knew immediately, I was like, "Oh, this is bad." But like I think having it right after the Heineken was just like, "Whoa!" It was like a night and day different. I think it was. You know, I want to go back and check the YouTube video because I probably made a face. I just made like, a Whoa, face too. That's way worse than Heineken. <laughs> it was yeah. It was way worse than Heineken. Um. So that brings us to Jeff. Do you want to snake draft this one? Okay, but all right. give it to me. So, yeah, my silver three. It's blue moon. What the fuck? Do you really? like this beer? It yeah. Taste good. <laughs> what the hell are you talking about? You're... It doesn't taste good. No, you're a dummy. <laughs> silver three is obviously Labatt blue. This beer is not ah, okay. good. This no, <laughs> Labatt blue. Get out of here. Get out of town. It's just. No. Okay. <laughs> then then my silver two. I'm gonna do silver two. I'm ready okay. for it. Okay. Is Heineken. Oh <laughs> here we go. Good. It's good. It's a silver it's two. Be an interesting, yeah. Okay, well, okay, so I I will say when I had this next beer, mm -hmm. my silver two, I was disappointed. I was disappointed in how it tasted and disappointed in myself in previous ratings. Because uh, this also wasn't very good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is it's this got my silver one last time. I'd like to go back and see what the competition was because the competition was pretty bad, I think. Yeah. And um I know that Labat Blue has a special place in your heart. I get that. I don't think it's great, which is funny because Heineken has always had a really negative place in my heart and oh, through, me too. Yeah. through this series Heineken has been a beer I've liked a lot more um obviously your silver one if you want to share it we all know what it is but are you gonna sh what are you doing ah Heineken <laughs> the red star so hopefully and... it was clear on the video but uh audio will not be heard but I was doing a drum roll but soon oh. probably it did i couldn't Cut hear i couldn't hear the drum roll thanks to zoom so yeah. i had no idea what you're doing i thought you were polishing the the, the can oh, okay yeah i guess my hands aren't <laughs> yeah i didn't see them so i thought you were like rubbing it to make it extra i was shiny. like that's so obvious what i'm doing i'm doing yeah. a perfect drum roll right no, now. No, sorry i had no idea um uh, <laughs> yeah, it was per perfectly on time just so you know yeah, yeah. thanks a lot zoom um but heineken of course mine was blue moon was my number one pick, um, which probably means Heineken wins the round. And then right. Blue Moon and and then Blue Moon is second, I think. Yes, but 
we'll talk about our rating system for the next whatever thing we do. But right. I think Fair. Heineken being number one probably matters the most. Um, so why do you hate this beer? What's wrong with Blue Moon? I just don't think it tastes good. I don't even have anything really beyond that. Like it tastes a little flat compared to all of the like lagers and pilsners, obviously, because sure. it's like a it's a wheat, it's different like style. Honestly, body. though, I just I just don't really like wheat beers, and so like the macro wheat beer is, yeah. is almost never going to appeal to me. It's so interesting because like. I also don't like wheat beers, but ones that are like, this is like apricot and like orange ones that have like fruit in it. I like it so much better. And of wheat beers, like I like these ones, other Hefeweizens I can get from like other breweries. I really don't like anything that tastes like banana. I'm like, so out. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah. Classic anti-banana yeah. beer. So like I get the, all those flavors a lot from those Hefeweizens. And so this wheat beer is one that I like um which i don't know if that makes me a basic bitch but whatever <laughs> blue moon is still one that i'll go to a, a bar and I'm i was good. debating putting it bottom but then i was like you know what like old style pilsner underwhelmed me so much that it, so it wouldn't be fair bad. to put blue moon bottom <laughs> i was expecting to put blue moon on the top and then i tasted it and i was like mm, damn that's so much better than the rest of these beers it's nice when that happens i, I had the opposite effect several yeah. times tonight where i was like i remember liking this beer and i was like Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I was I was prepared to think that it was worse than Heineken, but I I knew Heineken was strong, and there may be a time where we have to drink the uh, non alcoholic Heineken, the zero point zero. Mm -hmm. But it is it's pretty good. I think oh, Heineken's it? I it, it might be the best non alcoholic beer on the market. So, mm. um. Because it tastes very close to Heineken, and Heineken is actually pretty good. So, I'm I'm pretty I'm I'm all right with Heineken winning this. this episode. I'll have to give that a try. I've only tried like some of the worst ones, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I will tell you, um, Heineken's the best. And in Canada, if you go to Costco, they have smaller cans, but you get a thirty rack for thirty dollars, and that's mm. pretty nice. That's nice. what got me into it a little bit more and I was like oh yeah on the nights where I really want an extra one but I want my draft to go a little bit better than it's been going yeah I'll drink one of those and I still have to wake up you know at a yeah. reasonable hour yeah. so that is nice but anyway that is our our beer rankings for tonight oh what a beast of an episode but I love these drunken Vorthos oh, one they're of so my, fun they're so fun uh, and I hope you all had fun too, because it is time for closing time. And you can always reach us at Arena Regulars on Twitter and Instagram to tell us how much you like Drunken Porthos episodes. You may also find us on MTG Arena itself under the username Arena Regulars Podcast. If you say hello, we'll assume you're saying, I love Drunken Porthos episodes. <laughs> Uh, if you want to talk to me personally, you can find me at Zulberg, that is Z-E-U-L-B-E-R-G on Twitter and Instagram. But Jeff, where can they find you? Best place is the Discord channel. Uh, the link for our Discord channel is in the show notes, and you can hit me up there. I'm at regular Jeff. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Spotify. Leave us a review there. Go to YouTube. Leave us a comment. Hit that subscribe uh, button and any of the other things that you do uh, we just really would love to get any interaction with you folks and any feedback that you have is greatly appreciated this has been the arena regulars reminding you that if your friend gets completed don't try to bring them back kill them good night All right, that's fine.